Kurama isn't a bad creature. If you've just gotten into Naruto and all you know is the hateful fox living inside of a 12-year-old, trying to get him to free it so he can seek revenge, then you might easily be forgiven. But people sometimes fail to understand the general concept of Naruto, in which many of the villains aren't actually villains but well-intentioned people who fell to darkness and find themselves pitted against people who have chosen that the ends never justify the means, and that we should always strive to do no harm and save the world. The same is no less true for Kurama, just as it was no less true for Nagato, Obito, and even Madara Uchiha. The shinobi world chews people up and spits them back out, with most people turning toward evil because they want to change the world for the better but don't know how or in some cases because they were hurt and they want to hurt in return. There are a myriad of reasons why villains in Naruto turn out the way that they do, and Kurama's case is very similar. A tailed beast, a majestic creature, a spirit, a force of nature that was created by the Sage of Six Paths to be free, happy, and to help guide the world with the wisdom of the Sage. It was slowly corrupted through constant assaults and those who wished to turn its power against their enemies. In the end, Kurama would find himself imprisoned because of his sheer power, and his brethren hunted by Hashirama Senju in hopes that world peace could be established. Kurama's story is not one for the faint of heart. It's a tale of manipulation and abuse, creating a manipulator and an abuser. But like a scared child whose only reactions are to defend itself, when the hatred is bombarded by pure love, the scars of old begin to mend, and the soul of innocence is slowly restored. Join me today on this journey into Kurama's very soul. Let's explore a scenario in which Kurama was true to his feelings, and in turn found a friend that could help him cope with this situation, and perhaps even alleviate it. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day. So be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Most of our viewers are not subscribed to our channel, although they might think they are because YouTube loves to recommend us to the right people. But if you really want to support the channel, please hit that subscribe button and you'll know every time a new video comes out. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Thanks! Kurama, Majestic Beast a son to the Sage of Six Paths. Derived from his power, split into nine, Kurama came into existence before the old man himself. Kurama loved that old man. Playful and kind, the cub wanted nothing more than the attention of the one he loved most. But to his sorrow, he realized the reason with which he had been born. The old man was sick, dying. Perhaps Kurama only existed as a failsafe, but that didn't make him feel any less loved. Ninshu, the concept of using one's own chakra to connect to the hearts of others on a deeper level. Kurama shared that with his creator, something that began to show him wonder. Within each person was a completely different world, a world that looked exactly the same as his own but vastly different due to one's own perception. This brought him joy in learning to see things through a different light, and it brought him great sorrow. The moon was full, shining beautifully in the sky like the Hoshinotama of the Kitsune of old. A pearl that glistened with power, granting its influence over the fox. The yin energy pouring down from the skies, empowering it. Or so he would have felt if he weren't within a cage. A cage of flesh and bone. His mind was clouded, filled with rage. His deepest, darkest feelings let loose within him. He felt as if he were caught in a vortex of emotions. He was so angry. But why? Why was he angry? He couldn't remember. All he knew was that he wanted to kill and destroy. It was as if he had lost something precious to him. But what? He looked up at the sky, his eye catching the massive fox's star ball, the cratered moon as it looked down on them, the eye of Hamada hovering in the sky, judging the world for its endless wars. He thought back. He once lived in a shrine in the land of fire. He was a happy-go-lucky fox. He was large, but his strut was no less endearing. His dancing and the dragging of his tails carved into the face of the earth craters from lake to lake, forming rivers for the fish to swim in, for the humans to drink from. Oh, how he loved the humans. Each one bore within themselves a seed planted from his deceased father. Each one he loved as if they were the sage himself. The people looked up at him in awe. His upturned lips and gleeful eyes looked down upon them. More than once, he had witnessed a child cry in his presence, terrified of the thing they considered a monster. But when this happened, Kurama was not disheartened. He understood that his frame projected power, and from that power, people would naturally be afraid, especially the weakest among the humans who did not understand. For those children, he would adopt a smaller form. 
one far less intimidating, a form resembling the cub he once had been, but small enough to fit on their shoulder. He would nuzzle their cheeks and show the affection the sage had once shown him to calm their souls. The children began to cherish him, and the adults slowly lost their fear of this gentle creature. During the time of sowing of seeds, he would show up to various human settlements to help. Large paw prints dotted the landscape as claw marks crossed the tilled soil. New rivers formed nearby to ensure plenty of water for the land. Kurama would even spare some of his own nature chakra to feed the land when humans had yet to understand how overworking the ground could cause lower yields. It should have been a concept all new, but this small village which he favored seemed as ignorant as a newborn, and he loved that about them. They were innocent, just trying to live their best, and he was here to guide and help them. He was revered as a great spirit of this land, a servant of Inari, a Tenko who bridged the sky and granted wishes with his celestial fox powers. The times of harvest came, and each village always brought Kurama excess harvest to show gratitude for his help. Kurama didn't need to eat. He was a being made of chakra, and so long as the land was healthy, he would be too. But their gestures were so kind and pure of heart that he would accept it without a second thought. He would thank them for their provisions and take a smaller form with which to eat it before them. He would eat until he felt he couldn't eat any more. There was a girl. Her name was Kana. At the time, she was but a child, but she was fierce. Her hair was red like flame, and her personality was spicy as one. She was the human he liked the most. She bore within herself a love so deep that nothing seemed to stop her from caring for others, especially Kurama, with which she started out as a servant. Not because he asked or wanted one, but because she wanted to be one. He remembered the first time he met her. It was during harvest season when her father, the village chief of the fledgling settlement Kurama had been protecting, brought to him the yearly offering. As he took his smaller form to eat, she watched with the kindest smile on her face. She watched as he ate so much that he could barely consume another bite. He'd curl up into her lap to sleep and occasionally stretch and lay on his back and let her rub his belly to help him digest the food. She would giggle as his leg would kick the more she scratched him. He loved this human. She was his greatest friend. She would visit him almost every week. And the best part was that she was not afraid of him as other humans were. She would visit him weekly and would hug his massive paws and play on his back. He recalled letting her on and the two of them racing through the forests, the wind in their faces. She would laugh and he too would giggle at her amusement. Years passed and their friendship only grew deeper. Kurama was so pleased that he began to visit her too, transforming, taking human form just to walk inconspicuously among the humans. He hid form well. There were some tells though. Faint lines on his cheeks to represent his whiskers. The pupils of his eyes were slits like a fox. He also had a hard time hiding his tails for some reason. As the seasons passed, his hair would change colors, from a deep red in the summer to a washed out orange in the winter, but he always kept his smile. He would wander into the village in a somewhat regal white kimono, bearing a paw print on the back surrounded by Magatama. The people welcomed him like royalty, and to a point he was. He would spend this time visiting Kana, continuing to play and enjoy her company under her father's smile. Every visit was a feast. There was plenty of food to go around. Such was the blessing of their nature Kami. Kurama's influence brought maximum increase to their work, and his only wishes were that when they had excess, they let it not go bad and give it freely to the villages on hard times. This kind gesture was his way of spreading the love. He was truly living the sage's dreams. But the more he visited, the deeper his relationship with Kana became. And on one particular night, at the next harvest festival, Kana offered herself to Kurama as tribute alongside the food they often brought. He had always been there for her in her village, and in return, she wished to always be there for him. Taking her into his arms, the two were married. It was like a dream. Or perhaps this was where the legends of the Kitsune had come from. The trickster was the playful side of Kurama. The loving companion was who Kurama truly was, and the vengeful deity that was brought upon those who sought war and to destroy the land. And the further from the sages' generation they got, the more Indra's teachings took hold. The Senju and Uchiha clashed often. They threatened life on every side, and their use of chakra in a weaponized way brought war down upon the village Kurama loved so much. The young men and able-bodied elders took up their plows and shears and beat them into spears and swords for the defense of their home. They did not seek war, but they could not let the land be desecrated by those who sought only destruction. On such a night as that, the new harvest came in. A harvest of blood. A slaughter on the field of battle. An entire generation lost. Kana cried for weeks, her father having been killed in battle. Kurama scowled. He growled in rage that innocent life would be spilled to take what he gave so freely to the people. They twisted the land, salting the earth and making it desolate. He took up his blade that he had crafted for him by the greatest blacksmith in the land. 
Wielding this blade in one hand, and the scythe of Kana's father in the other, Kurama made his way off to war to strike vengeance upon those who would dare harm the land or its people. His presence in battle struck fear into the hearts of those who fought. The wars ended as quickly as they began, the great fox of the heavens having descended upon the earth to destroy those who had taken away his father-in-law. Kurama had learned what it meant to be human. He had learned love on a deeper level, and having that love threatened had forced this vengeful Kami to take up arms and smite those who did evil. More than once, he found himself facing off against the Uchiha alongside the Senju. It was during such a time that he faced the Uchiha clan leader, Ryoshi Uchiha. The power of the Sharingan was a power derived from the Sage of Six Paths, and the strength of Imangekyo Sharingan was so much that Kurama was struck and wounded. Bleeding on the ground, he believed he might die. But when Akihito Senju stepped up, he defended Kurama and pushed Ryoshi back. Kurama would wake up in a tent, his wounds patched up, and Kana by his side, lovingly stroking his cheek. He smiled and looked to Akihito and offered thanks to the man. He would put his hand on Akihito's chest and speak, Soon, very soon, your clan's founder, Ashura, will be reborn. He'll be born in your line. I've witnessed the future. I plant within you a seed. When next this child is born, he will receive a portion of my power, my nature power. The ability to command the increase of the lands. I foresee him being the pillar to something greater. A cease of war. An era of peace. Bringing with him the protection of both Senju and Uchiha. A peace he will fight, kill, and die to protect. I shall offer him the power that few have wielded on earth to accomplish his goals. Akihito was stunned. To have received the blessing of Inari himself upon his family line, he was left without words. Days passed weeks, and months, and the war fled from their tiny village. But they were entering a new era, one where war was becoming commonplace. Clans besides the Uchiha and Senju were starting to war. All the while, Kurama would be blessed with the conception of his first child. Sitting there, a gentle smile on his face as he listened closely to the stomach of Kana, sensing a child within whose chakra was strong, bearing his energy, yet being holy and completely physical like Kana. But wars once again flared up and the tiny village was caught in the middle. Once more, the men prepared for war. Kurama, the de facto leader of this village, would lead them into battle. Upon hearing of a conspiring of multiple villages to destroy his little settlement, Kurama and his own group of elite warriors with whom he imbued his own power, a group he called Tenko, set off to destroy the villages that conspired against them. And he was successful. Returning to his home, feeling as if he could finally take a breath, Kurama let out a sigh. But the closer he drew, the more smoke he saw. His eyes widened, and immediately he was in the trees along with his elite warriors, jumping from limb to limb. Reaching the clearing, he saw it. The flames of the village. He heard the crying of his men as they abandoned formation and ran into the village to save their families. Kurama could not blame them. Soon after, he did the same. Stepping into the center of his burning village, he released a massive wave of wind-style chakra to blow the flames out and rushed towards the home of the chieftain. There, he found servant bodies littered across the ground. Slumping in a corner, he found Kana. Rushing to her aid, he found no pulse, her body littered with stab wounds, a pool of blood gathering about the floor. He rushed over. No, please no. I'm begging you, no. He pressed his ear against her chest as his knees, his white kimono, dipped down into the blood, staining red. He attempted to fill her full of his chakra. He did everything in his power to restore Kana to life and, in turn, their unborn child, but nothing worked. He held her in his arms and cried out into the heavens with every negative emotion, wrath and anger. How could this be? What was this concept of love? He had cherished it for so long and now it was the blade he fell upon. Never before had Kurama wanted to die. Right now, he wanted to pull his own blade out and shove it deep into his heart so that he may fall into the afterlife where she was, but he knew that was not possible. He already was a spirit and he could never pass into the afterlife. He was bound to this earth for eternity. How could humans be so evil? How could they do this to him? He had gifted them with protection, with food. He even blessed those who he had fought against, providing food to the very villages that now use the strength derived from that very food to steal his meaning in life away. Those villages had destroyed him. What did he do to deserve this? He stepped out into the greater village, his anger swirling about like a bloody whirlpool. The elite members who had received his blessing of chakra had also lost. They viewed their commander as his expression became that of a vengeful god. They could sense it within him. He was about to level the entire area. So they fled. Those warriors would immortalize their liege though. When next they formed a village to live and propagate, they remembered him and who he was. A swirling vortex of love, wrath, and finally at the end, 
blood. And so they named their village Uzushiogakure. Kurama, alone in a village where nothing survived, suddenly took his fox form, a size as large as the mountains that he now peeked over to witness the villages of his enemies who had just destroyed everything he loved. How dare they? How dare they exist any longer in his presence? Their mere existence, the face he had fed them, it all became offense to him. Their lives were offensive, their faces were offensive, their prayers and cries for mercy were offensive. He set about systematically annihilating each and every village in the vicinity. His mercy fell upon none, not the men, nor the women, nor the children. Even the cattle were not spared. If it held within it a breath of life, he revoked their rights to draw it. In one single night, Kurama had gained a new name, the Demon Fox. He began to murder those who had once brought offerings to him, but had grown too greedy. His blessings had made them soft, had made them gluttonous. His kindness had inspired selfishness and self-entitlement within these people. And now, the only good people that he could see in this world had been thrown upon the sword. The mountains were leveled. The villages were craters. The entirety of nature within the land of fire cried out in sorrow. And for two years, no new crops grew in the land. Starvation set in, and for a time the wars dulled. Kurama returned to his temple, forever changed, his heart shredded. He had left it open for all to experience. Love. Scars covered that heart now. Fragile like glass, he coated it in ice to keep it from ever hurting again. As his touch with humans began to fade into nothing, the greed and depravity of man had once again arisen, and many came to seek his power, chief among which were the gold and silver brothers who he devoured for the hell of it. Let his body break down their frames slowly, painfully. He hoped they screamed in agony for weeks. But this was not so. The only one in agony was Kurama. Not only was he in pain as the lining in his stomach was devoured by these two, but the very thought of having the same kind of people who had killed Kana living within him made him physically sick. In his shrine, he would just lay there, writhing, part of him hoping that they would kill him and the other half wishing they would die. He tried everything he could to settle this pain, from the cool burn of mint leaves to drowning them with water. Nothing stopped the determination of these humans. Like larvae, they continued to eat through his body until he could no longer handle it. He began to eat grass. A lot of it. Grass, trees, anything green he could eat to induce vomiting. Eventually, as his face was as emerald green as the land about him, he released all he had devoured, including the cursed gold and silver brothers, whose devouring of his flesh had turned them into warped children, the unwanted sons of Kodama. He tried to smash them, to kill them, but their power had been increased by many times as they fled. Once more, Kodama found himself destroying those nearby him for attempting to hurt him. Humans. Such vile creatures, he thought to himself. He looked back on his time spent in the form of one and regretted it. He never again would take the form of a human. They were a mistake. A blemish on the face of a perfect world. He hated that the sage had gifted them chakra. If he hadn't, they surely would not be using it to kill each other and himself. After another wave of destruction, he once more returned to his shrine and brooded for years. But as time passed by like the hands of a clock, war began to dull and form into peace. For a second, Kurama almost sighed in relief. Perhaps finally he could rest. Wrong. A man of dark hair and glistening red eyes appeared before him. He had a commanding presence. As if his mere form demanded that Kurama show fealty to him. He had only felt this presence once before, but he could not pin where. His eyes glowing out of the darkness of his shrine like burning coals. Why have you come, human? Madara would smirk, his scythe in his hand. I have come to put a leash on you, great fox. It's time you and I went for a walk. Kurama growled, his mind running through emotions. He hid it well. Leave, human. Forget your foolish quest for power and return to your village. Madara would plant the gun by Uchiwa, the war fan of his clan, on the ground as he loudly declared it, openly, as if testifying to not only the entirety of the world, but to God himself upon his throne. I have no village any longer. And soon, nobody else will either. Kurama, like a demon, roared as he crawled out of his shrine. Madara did not flinch, only smiling as he raised his fingers to his face. Kurama had gazed into the ruby orbs only once, but that was all it took for Madara to cast him under Genjutsu. Everything beyond that was a fog. He didn't know much beyond what he was experiencing now as he gazed up at the moon. He heard a battle cry. Hashirama! Suddenly, he felt his body lurch forward, as if thinking on its own. He felt a warmth as sapphire armor coated his fur. Before him stood a 1,000-armed wooden idol. 
It broke free from its base and began to walk towards him. The wooden headpiece it wore, like a golem, engaged with Kurama and struck him back. In his own head, Kurama wanted to break free, but every ounce of hatred he had towards Madara was funneled and focused on Hashirama. Kurama witnessed the wood release of the first Okage and felt deep resentment in his heart, Ashura. He had gifted him the power of the land, of increase and fertile land, and now it was being used against him. Suddenly, he felt a break from the Genjutsu. The cage he'd been trapped in was opened and Kurama burst out with a roar. That Genjutsu had tried to increase Kurama's strength and drive by dragging up everything, Kana included. He saw it in his mind's eye. Her death played over and over again. But with each new replay, a new person stood in front of her. Hashirama stood there. Madara stood there. Indra and Ashura. He cried out for them to stop. My father is the sage, he cried to them, bound and unable to move. Are we not brothers, he whimpered through tears. This did not stop them from ending Kana's life. And that rage was now fueling Kurama as he now forgot any allegiance. Indra, Ashura, Uchiha, Senju, none of that mattered anymore. He would kill them both and then eradicate their people. But suddenly, a wooden hand touched his forehead, and a command echoed through his brain. Sit. Kurama's eyes slowly closed as wooden pillars rose behind him and enclosed him. He fell asleep. When next he awoke, he was within another cage. But this time, he was not caged in his own subconscious, but in someone else's. He witnessed a woman sitting far from him, Mito Uzumaki. She sat there, her back turned to him. He tried to reach out his hand to claw her, but she was protected by adamantine chains that sucked more chakra from him. Kurama pulled back and recognized this chakra as the same as of the people who had left his village after Kana's death, those who would call themselves Uzumaki. So even you have betrayed me, Uzumaki, he thought. After having gifted them with his incredible chakra reserves, those chakra reserves were now being used against him. She refused to acknowledge him. As time would pass, he would witness a light in the sky, something hovering above his cage. It grew louder and brighter the longer it was there, and he had understood that he was within the wife of Ashura's next incarnate, Hashirama Senju. The glowing light was an infant growing within its mother, a baby. She was pregnant. In a rage, he attempted to reach up and drain the infant of its life force. This was an insult to him. None knew that he had so long wanted to see the child stolen from him, and now he was witness to this? He would not. If he couldn't see his own child, then why should they be able to? He tried to kill it, not because he needed the chakra, but merely because he found this new life offensive. He wanted it to die. That was the only reason. As he raised his hands higher, a set of chains appeared from the wall and gripped his hands to hold him down. Kurama fought to free himself. In punishment for attempting to steal the baby's chakra, the chains exacted a toll, taking some of Kurama's own chakra and feeding the child with it, causing the light to grow brighter. He was left in that light for so long, blinded by it as it grew, the sound of laughter filling the area. He turned his back to the gate and covered his ears, hoping he could sleep the gestation time away. He nearly escaped the day the child was born. As the child exited from its mother, Kurama planned his own escape, attempting to bust through the seal and back into the world for vengeance. But Hashirama would not allow it. Sealing formulas were poured on top of sealing formulas, before being wrapped up in a nice little bow made of wood release. This induced within Kurama a sensation of sleep which stole from him his consciousness. By the time he awakened, it was over. And so, for years, he rotted in a cell as he waited for the absurdly old Uzumaki woman to die. Eventually, a time would come that she should die, and he was ready to exact his revenge. It was then that he had been ripped from within his cage and sealed into another one. This cage was different. He would not be freed. He had merely been transferred. He cursed the Uzumaki and turned to his cage and slept falling into a depression, realizing he would be imprisoned forever. But something was different about this prison. It possessed a more innocent nature to it. He opened his eyes one day to see a little girl staring at him. He stared back at her. She watched. My host, he thought to himself. She's curious. She wants to know what I am. I'll show her what I am. His claw quickly reached out and slammed against the ground with a loud thud. As his snout pressed through the gate, his eyes glowing with pure hatred, Come closer, girl, his voice boomed through the void. She would flee from him, disappearing into the darkness. He pulled back into the darkness and slumbered. Time passed. He wasn't sure how much. All the days melted together. But eventually, she returned, once more curious. And just like before, he drove her off. But once more, she appeared a third time. She's a fool. Why does she return, he asked himself. This time, he was curious enough to ask her. Why do you return to me ceaselessly, you vexing cur? She would approach the cage. Because 
I don't like seeing you by yourself. Kurama was confused. What kind of idiocy is this? Speaking in a low growl, he talked to her. I would rather fall to insanity than receive company from you, worm. She sat down and looked up at him. Miss Mito said you're a hateful fox, that all you live for is to kill, and that you weren't good for anything but to be a weapon. Kurama snarled. The irreverence of this human cub, to dare address a god like that. To call them useless after only caging them up. But she was not done speaking. I don't think so, though. His eye turned towards her. I think you're sad. You're angry. I think you're hurt. He growled at her. You think a human could dare scratch me without fancy tricks? She shook her head. No, I mean, I think your heart is hurt. Your spirit. Your eyes hold a sadness to them. You hide it through a scowl, but your eyes cry. Kurama looked into her. What was this girl? She would dare try to empathize with him? It was true that Kurama had in the past possessed the ability to empathetically connect with others. It was what had once made his life so worthwhile, but now it was a curse. He did not expect her to gain access to it by merely taking it in. He stepped back into the darkness. Show me your scars. Do not pretend to be a friend when you hold me in a cage. She would cock her head. Hi, I'm Kushina. Kushina Uzumaki. It's nice to officially meet you, Ninetales. Kurama sneered at her addressing his name by the number of his tails. He had once been so much more than just a number. He turned and hid in the darkness of his cell and ignored her. She would call out to him and speak to him, but he pretended to sleep. She would eventually leave and he would know peace, but the days after, she continued to return. Every day she returned over and over again to the cage. He slowly began to grow tired of this. Leave me be, you pretentious whelp. I want nothing from you but your cries of agony as I rip through your flesh and snuff your worthless life. She would look into his eyes. You weren't always like that, were you? He looked down on her with rage. She continued to look up at him with curiosity. When I was younger, I grew up in Uzo Shiogakure. My mother and father used to tell me the story of the great fox, the deity Inari, and his astounding love for humans. The moment you entered into me, I couldn't help but remember those stories. Kurama's lip twitched as he uttered a low, guttural growl. Those are but stories. I am the destroyer. I eradicated your villages and people. All that lived and breathed air, I slaughtered them all, from the oldest elder to the youngest infant. Do not think you know me based on an old legend. She smiled. So it was you after all. You're Inari. She beamed like the sun. The story said that you forged the rivers and lakes, and that you were the spirit of rice, agriculture, fertility, and metalwork. To this day, the Kogetsune Maru is sought as a symbol of one of your greater works of craftsmanship. Kurama tried to claw her, his hand reaching out as far as possible, hoping that he might be capable of scratching her out of existence, but the girl was smart. She sat just one foot away from where his claw's maximum extended range ended. He barked at her like a rabid dog. She continued, What happened to Inari? You can't say he never existed. If he never had, these stories wouldn't exist. Kurama returned to his cage and ignored her. She sighed, Okay, fine. If you don't want to tell me the story, then I'll just keep coming back over and over again until you do. And so she left once more. Kushina had been told by Mito that this chakra monster was a being made up of only the deepest hatred for mankind, and that the only way to resist him was with love. Mito had said this in a way expecting her to fill her life with love, but Kushina had taken it literally and was trying to physically fight Kurama's hatred with love, love for him, attacking his negative feelings at the heart. Kurama would continue to exist within the caged void until she returned again. Continuing to keep his back to her, he ignored her. She would hum and work creatively. Sometimes she would imagine some scrap paper and sketch things or make origami. Many of her drawings were of Kurama since he was right there and wasn't going anywhere. The perfect reference. One day, as he kept turned away from her, he felt something, like a flea crawling up his tail. He felt it and his eyes opened. He stood and his tail whipped, causing Kushina to go flying. She moaned as she sat up. Kurama raged against the bars, the entire cage shaking as his rage released itself like an agitated caged ape. It is a curse to humankind to touch one of my majestic tails. How dare you touch it? She sat up. It just looked so fluffy. I couldn't help it. He scowled at her. Leave me. Now! She stood and proceeded to leave. She stopped though. I left you something in there. She exited her own subconscious. Kurama looked around and then found some drawings. She had drawn images of Kurama. Some of them were just him, others were of him and her. But most striking of all, she had drawn an image of him in what appeared to be a human form. One identical to what he had assumed in years gone by. And with each of these images, he bore a gentle expression. Nothing he had ever shown Kushina. He looked up. How did she know this? 
The next day, she returned and witnessed him brooding in the corner of his cage. Hi, Ninetales. Kodama would growl. What is this? He pushed the image of his human form towards her. She looked at it. Well, it's you. He bashed the cage with his head. Did you probe my mind? Some accursed jutsu, he demanded to know. She shook her head. Then he continued. Where did you get this image? She was a little startled, but kept her composure. I dreamt it one night. I dream of you sometimes. His eyes stared at her through his eyebrows. You dream of me. She nodded. In my dreams, I sometimes ride upon your back through the forest, and sometimes I see you different. I see you as a tiny fox sprawled out over my lap as I scratch your tummy. Your leg kicks so cutely. Kurama was mortified. Who set you up to this? Is this a mind game you're playing with me? She shook her head. No, I just dream about you at night. I think about all those old stories at night, and then as I sleep, I just imagine what you were like. These dreams then happen all by themselves. He looked down at the paper again, and then back up at Kushina. Kana? She looked at him with curiosity, her head cocked to one side as he spoke. Kurama pushed the picture back. What are you? He asked. She smiled and pointed at herself. My name is Kushina Uzumaki, the last surviving member of the Uzumaki clan. Kurama turned his head to look at her out of the corner of his eye. The last surviving member of the Uzumaki clan. She nodded. I came from Uzoshiogakure, a village known for its sealing jutsu and high chakra reserves. We were strong, but the other nations feared us. So as I left for Konoha, Uzoshiogakure was assaulted and destroyed by neighboring villages. He sat there and took it all in. He looked down at the little girl in front of him. She then looked up. I told you about me. Now it's only fair that you tell me about yourself, Inari. Kurama laid down within his cage and relented. Fine. He began to recount to her his tale, how he protected the land, provided for the villages, and how he fell in love with a woman named Kana, but he also spoke of the darker side of things, including the wars and the death that he witnessed. I eradicated everything and everyone within the vicinity of me. Nothing and no one survived. He looked down at her. She was crying openly, her hands raised to her eyes as if they were trying to catch the tears. Why do you cry? He asked as she did so. She looked up. Why did they have to kill her? Why couldn't they let you be happy? He was stunned by her question. She continued, Is that why you've become so mean? They killed your love. Seeing this, Kurama felt a strange feeling within himself, something he hadn't experienced in ages. He slowly approached the gate, his nose pushed out to her face. His cold, wet nose touched her forehead. Do not cry for me. You did not kill Kana. She looked up and hugged onto his nose. You shouldn't have had to suffer like that. I wish I could go back in time right now and take her place so you could be happy. Kurama sat there for a moment. You do not need to do that, Kushina. Just so long as you continue to come and talk to me, I will be happy. She looked up, her tears drying, and she smiled. I promise. I'll come talk to you every day. And so she did. She would visit his cage every day. Eventually, her bravery and trust won out, and she passed through the cage. He welcomed her into the space. There, she would hug up against him. He would let her play on his fluffy tails and smile as she giggled, crawling up them and sliding back down. They would continue to converse and speak. They would enjoy their time together, but eventually, one day, she didn't show up. He would gaze out at the void. Kushina, he would call out. Kushina, where are you? Her apparition would appear, tears in her eyes. She spoke. I can't visit today, Kurama. He would come to the gate. Why? She looked up at him. People have taken me. They're bringing me back to their village. They're going to take you away from me. Kurama was shocked. No, I will not allow it, Kushina. She continued to cry. He called out louder. Kushina! He looked down to her. Do you trust me? She nodded. He then continued. Then remove the tag on my gate. Remove the tag and open the seal. Give me freedom. If you do this, I will save you. At any other time, he could have used this sort of moment to escape. And if she had been any other Jinchuriki, he would have abandoned her the moment she ripped the tag off. But not this time. She removed the tag and the gate opened. He stepped out with a look of noble determination, like a knight stepping up to save his princess. In the darkness of the night, as Kushina walked alongside the Kumonin, suddenly with a puff of smoke, Kurama appeared. The massive fox appeared and began to tear apart the Kumonin. He ran off through the forest, Kushina on his back. As the wind blew through her hair, she smiled. As they came closer to the village, Kurama would stop. He would assume human form, the form of a boy no older than Kushina. Still, he had issues with hiding his tails and ears, so he stuffed his ears into a hat and wrapped his tails around his waist. He spoke with his deep voice. Shall I walk you in? She was a little struck by the awkwardness of his voice. Okay, but whatever you do, don't speak. Kurama walked her into the village. Quickly, the two were apprehended. 
brought to the Hokage for questioning, she spoke on behalf of Kodama. This boy rescued me. The third looked skeptically at him. Who is he? Kushina looked back. His name is... His name is Inari, Inari Uzumaki, another survivor of the Uzumaki clan downfall. Hiruzen looked him over for a moment and thought he witnessed fox slits for eyes, but no, the irises were round like any other human. What do you have to say for yourself? Kurama didn't speak. Kushina stepped in for him. He can't speak, Lord Third. He was there when the village fell and they attempted to slit his throat. All they did was sever the vocal cords. Kurama took that to mean that he needed to sport a new scar. So, as his head was looking down, he formed a scar over his neck that would fool the Hokage. Hiruzen would nod. Kushina would ask if he could remain, reminding him that he had saved her and done the village a favor. Hiruzen would agree to this and state that he could stay in the village due to his great service to it in returning Kushina home. From there, Kurama waited not too far from her. He still left the presence within her to keep her alive, but he wanted to keep close to her anyway, just in case. She explained everything to them and upon being released, she offered to keep an eye on the boy. She led him back to her abode, where she would have an Anbu guard for the foreseeable future. She walked in and sat down. She looked at him. Thank you, Kurama. I'm grateful that you saved me. He spoke. You've become the first friend I've had since I lost everything, Kushina. I do not wish to lose you. I want to continue to protect you. She smiled. I would be grateful if you did. He would smile, and then suddenly, in a puff of smoke, he was gone, having returned inside of her. He was free, able to roam as he wanted, leave if he so pleased. But he didn't want to, as leaving would kill her, and he would not lose Kana again. As this massive fox-shaped frame laid down, he would look out into the darkness. Kushina would eventually show up again within this realm that he called home. Kushina, what brings you here so late? He asked as she stood there in her pajamas. The academy, I, I don't have any friends there. A lot of kids tease me because my hair is red. Since you can take a form outside of my body, I was wondering if you'd be willing to go to school with me. It would be suspicious to the Hokage if Inari Uzumaki just up and vanished without explanation. Kurama scoffed and smiled. Okay, I'll go. I'd like to see more about this leaf village that Ashura has created. The sun rose as early as it always did. The sun was always up bright and early. The sun was always on time. Two things Kushina was not. She was still in bed right now, drooling a miniature lake into one of the craters her nose had left in her pillow. Her snores sounded like a lumberjack having issues cranking his chainsaw, and her hair, well, you couldn't see anything but her hair. It was sticking out in all directions, matted and hanging in her mouth. Suddenly, in a chair in the corner of the room, Kodama appeared, taking the form she'd previously named Inari Uzumaki, just watching her. He looked out the window. He was quite sure when this academy she went to began, but he knew that if he did not wake her up now, they would likely be tardy. Not that this was anything new to Kushina. Kodama, on the few occasions that he tapped into her senses during the times before he realized who she was, knew that she was always being yelled at and punished for being late to class. Hey, Kushina, wake up! She was out of bed in a mere second, standing on the ceiling like some cat from a cartoon, having been scared half out of its skin. He looked up at her. Are we going to the academy today, or do you plan to sleep all day? She came down to the ground and grabbed her watch to look at the time. Her eyes looked as if they might fall out of her head, they were so wide. Oh crap, we're gonna be late! She stumbled out of the room, grabbing the clothes she was planning to wear. She sniffed the armpits of her shirt and fell into the bathroom. Kurama, eating a piece of toast, listened in. The water was running, the hairdryer was on, and the sound of a toothbrush's bristles scrubbing quick and violently over teeth could be heard. He stepped back away and began to check if he had everything Kushina told him he would need for his first day at the academy. He was satisfied it was all there. Honestly, he wasn't sure how to feel. Was he excited? Well, that was the thing. He didn't know. A part of him looked forward to trying out this school thing, but another part of him did not look forward to being surrounded by more human cubs. And he definitely did not feel the need to learn the things he'd experienced firsthand. In fact, he was certain that whatever they told him would likely be wrong. But just so long as he could experience it with Kushina, it might be fun. He downed some juice to wash the dry toast down. Kushina raced out of the bathroom with one shoe on, hopping as she pulled on the other one, tying up her hair after finishing. Coming down the hall like an avalanche, she grabbed her bag and wedged a piece of toast between her teeth as she grabbed Kurama's hand. Hurry, we gotta go now! The two raced out of the house. As they ran down the road, Kushina finished her toast. She licked the tips of her fingers and then rubbed them on the sides of her shorts. To the roof, it's a straight shot, it's quicker. Kodama followed her lead and hopped onto the roof. He saw how she expertly maneuvered the obstacles. He would have been impressed by her reflexes if he didn't know that she had memorized this path after taking it a thousand times prior. Jumping back down to street level, they raced into the gated building and into the halls. Nobody was there, so it was an easy run. Suddenly, someone appeared. A group of shinobi were repairing one of the rooms after a fireball jutsu mishap. 
Carrying 4x4 planks out, they saw her coming but couldn't move. Going down on her left leg, her right foot pushed out and she slid under it. Kurama, who was running on all fours as if he were still a fox, jumped on top of the planks and catapulted himself off, hitting the ground behind Kushina as she rose back to her feet, not missing a stride. Taking a turn, they had so much momentum that the only way for them to keep going was to launch off the wall and continue on. They saw the door at the other end of the hall. It was closed, but she saw the homeroom teacher standing in front of the class. We're gonna be late, we're gonna be late! She rushed forward and slammed the door open just as the teacher was finishing roll call. Here, she shouted, and the teacher looked over. I already called your name. You're late. She stepped in and prostrated herself before the teacher. The teacher sighed. You're just in time to help introduce your new friend. I understand he's incapable of speech. She rose from the ground and nodded. He's a survivor of the Uzumaki clan downfall. They tried to kill him, but he survived, despite the loss of ability to speak. Kurama stepped in and offered a slight bow of respect. The teacher stood to the side and let the two children take their place at center stage. As Kurama stepped forward, Kushina spoke. This is Inari Uzumaki. He's a distant cousin to myself and has a distant blood relation with the Senju clan. He used to be in my class at Uzoshiogakure before I transferred here. I hope you all welcome him. Kurama offered a bow of respect. One of the kids in the back scoffed. Great, another tomato head. Kurama's eyes darted up at the kid, his hearing the best in the class. The kid looked down on him with surprise, wondering how he could hear what he said under his breath. The homeroom teacher then stepped up behind them. Feel free to take your seats wherever you want. And might I say, it's our honor to house another member of the Uzumaki clan. Konoha and Uzoshio were the greatest of allies. I'm sorry to hear of the loss. I had friends there. Kurama offered another bow to the teacher as Kushina did as well. Your care is welcomed. Thank you. The two of them began to make their way up the stairs when suddenly a blonde boy stopped them. Hey, Kushina, have you thought about what I said earlier? She looked over. I'm just not interested in you like that, Minato. I'm sorry. He leaned back in his chair with disappointment, balancing a pencil on his top lip. They then took their seats close to the back, where Kodama was less likely to have to interact with anyone and could freely speak without anyone hearing him. As they took their seats, he looked over to her. Who was that cub? She looked over at him. Cub? Oh, you mean Minato. That's Minato Namakaze, a boy without a real clan. I believe he's an orphan. He's really nice, but I think he comes on too strong. I would love him as a friend, but he keeps pushing for more. Shall I kill him for you? Kodama asked. Kushina almost burst out laughing. <laughs> no, no, you don't need to kill him. He's still a friend. Suddenly, the homeroom teacher called out. Hey, you two be quiet. If you disrupt class again, I'll have you two separated. Kushina then called out. Yes, sensei. Sorry, sensei. She then spoke in a hushed tone. Let's just focus on class for now. And that's exactly what they did. They focused, but Kurama wasn't very interested. It seemed like he already had enough experience and knowledge to pass for a jonin, let alone a genin. But he perked up when they began talking about history. The teacher spoke. The long and bloody history of the Nine Tails is one full of death and destruction. For generations, it tormented the people and eradicated entire settlements. Its tales destroying the fertile farmlands and killing thousands. It wasn't until the great founding Hokage, Hashirama Senju, sealed it away that we knew peace. Now, the Nine Tails' powers can be used for good and the defense of mankind, whether it wishes to or not. Kushina sat beside him and looked over to the side at Kurama, whose faces bore annoyance. In his grip was a pencil he'd been twirling around. However, the more the teacher spoke, the more pressure he subconsciously put on the pencil until eventually it snapped in two. Kushina raised her hand into the air. The teacher looked at it. I haven't started asking questions yet, Miss Uzumaki. She stood. I know, Sensei. My apologies, but we already know about the bloody history of the Nine Tails. Can you tell us stories about the good things it did instead? The teacher seemed confused. Good things? She nodded. My people, the Uzumaki, have legends about the Nine Tails. Our legends always spoke of it in a good light. It was a kami of the land and of nature. It helped provide for the nations during great famines and was worshipped as a protective spirit. The teacher looked down. We don't have anything in our textbooks about that. It's an interesting story, Miss Uzumaki, and any other time I would like to hear it, but right now we're in history class and only history will be taught here, so please, take your seat. She sat back down and looked over to Kurama. He looked to her out of the corner of his eye and offered an approving nod. He then proceeded to gaze at the window and ignore everything the insufferably ignorant teacher was saying. At lunch, Kushina once again found herself surrounded by the boys in the class who wished to torment her about the color of her hair. She normally could beat them up and would beat them up, but not today. Today she had company. The boys would turn to look and see Inari Uzumaki standing there. I guess tomatoes always grow in a bunch, they laughed. But slowly their laughter died down as they looked into the boys' eyes. The glow there, the look he gave, it was as if they suddenly realized that they were about to die. They felt his intent. He had to give them credit. Most adults would flee at the sight of this, but these kids stood their ground and in fact turned on him in hopes of beating him. This meant one of two things. Either they were courageous or they were very stupid. 
Perhaps it was a mix of both. That's generally what made the most daring and successful warriors. He recalled those in the past that were like that, and some of the most daring and stupid warriors he ever recalled were the Uchiha, and one of these boys probably was one, distantly, probably one of his grandparents. They were always so sure of themselves, whether they deserved to be or not. One struck out at him, drawing blood from his lip. He turned around slowly to look at them as blood dripped from his face. He punched the boy in the face hard enough to send him flying into the wall, leaving it cracked. He turned and punched one of the bullies in the stomach via an uppercut, which sent the bully into the ceiling where he stayed. The third one fell on his rear and began to push away, raising his arms in search of some defense, his voice unable to beg for the mercy his eyes were pleading for. Kodama spread his claws as he approached him. He raised his hand into the air, preparing for a single swift motion that would end the child's life for good. But before he could follow through, he felt Kushina grab his hand. That's enough, Inari. They're not going to be causing us any trouble anymore. Kurama let his claws return to the fingernails they once had been. He silently walked over to his chair and sat down, appearing somewhat satisfied with himself. Kushina took her seat as well. It was frightening to think that Kurama could have committed murder, but she was glad to know that he was there to stand up for her when she couldn't. As they sat there, the boy in the ceiling finally became dislodged through the pull of gravity, hitting the ground below. Yeah, Kurama and Kushina ended up getting punished for that. Many days were spent staying after, cleaning the chalkboard, sweeping the classroom, and just sitting there. As the sun set, they were on their way back to Kushina's home. She looked over. Thanks for protecting me, but we do need to work on how much strength you use. Those boys really deserve to get their asses kicked, but it would be too much hassle if they were killed. That would get us into real trouble, like thrown up and under the jail kind of trouble. Just as she was saying that, a group of older shinobi surrounded them. Two Genin and one Chunin. The older brothers of the kids Kodama had utterly obliterated in class. The shinobi wearing the flak jacket stepped forward. I hear you've been bullying my kid brother here, he said with a smirk of anticipation. Kushina stepped forward. They started it. They're the ones who were bullying us. And your brothers were the ones who struck first. I say they got what they deserved. The shinobi scoffed. You talk all high and mighty for an outsider, tomato head. You think you can just walk into our village and act like you own the place? You're just an academy student. Me? I survived the tuning exams and came out on top, he said pointing to his flak jacket. I've done things you can't even imagine doing, and I'm about to take all the strength it took me to survive and use it to kick your asses, starting with you, Inari. I'm going to end your shinobi career right here and now. The unexpected reaction here was that Kodama smiled. He finally understood. Definitely stupid. No courage, just ignorance, he thought to himself. The three shinobi ran forward. Kushina, in a rage, screamed out, Yeah, big move! Gang up on the kid! Village is definitely safe with freaks like you around! Kodama stepped forward. As the three met him, they found themselves on the ground as Kodama stood in the trees above. The shinobi stood and looked up. What, running already? They threw a flurry of shuriken up at him, which he then dodged. He hit the ground and turned to face them. They weaved their hand signs and each launched a fireball jutsu at him. One formed from the three. Kushina was appalled. She saw the fire eat up Kodama. She called out to him, Kodama! The three shinobi straightened their backs and looked back with a touch of concern. Maybe we went a little too far. The Chunin then spoke. No body, no proof. But now we gotta silence the girl, too. They turned to Kushina and began to approach. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Minato arrived with a kunai in his hand. You won't touch her, he shouted. The three shinobi laughed. And who's gonna stop us? You? Minato didn't take his eyes off them. Still, he spoke. Silently, as if to be unheard by everyone but Kushina, he said, Run away now. Go get help. I'll hold them off. Suddenly, there was a roar. Not just any roar, though. The roar of a beast. They turned back. In the fire, they saw the shadow of a young boy, but above him, the fire formed into the silhouette of the Ninetales. He rushed forward and struck out at them with enough force to send the two Genin into the wall. He then formed a tailed beast bomb in his hand and drove it into the stomach of the Chunin, blasting him off Team Rocket style. He seemed feral, his hair standing on ends. But he wasn't done, though. He turned his head to see the bully he spared earlier. The boy quaked in his shoes. He turned and attempted to run, but Kodama was on him in a moment. Tackling him to the ground, Kodama straddled him and raised his fist, bringing it down on the boy's face over and over again. Kushina and Minato stood speechless at not only the strength, but the brutality. Nine pristine tails appeared from behind Kodama as the ears of a fox appeared atop his head. He's gonna kill him, Minato shouted as he ran forward. Kodama, stop! Kushina stepped forward. She shot adamantine chains that wrapped around his neck, arms, and feet, pulling him off the kid and forcing him to his knees. He growled and raged, foam dripping from his mouth. Kushina stepped forward, a swirling mark appearing on the palm of her hand. She pressed it to his forehead. Go back in, right now! Suddenly, the boy was reverted to chakra and returned to his jinchuriki. She stood there trying to catch her breath. She turned around to look at the carnage and saw only Minato staring at her. What the hell was that? 
Kushina ignored the question and turned to the boy Kodama had been beating. His face was swollen, battered, and bruised. He needs to go to the hospital, Minato said. Kushina looked down. Call one. I'm going home. Once you call the medical nin, I suggest you leave too. No one will ever believe that this could be done by us. Minato looked around at the carnage. Thankfully, none of the bullies that came for them had been killed. The youngest, who Kodama had beaten within an inch of his life, tried to implicate Kushina, Kodama, and Minato. But his older brother, the Chunin, refused to elaborate on who beat them. The shame of being beaten by someone half his age and size, especially when teamed up with two other people, was too much to acknowledge. Because of this, Kushina and Kodama were never approached by the Konoha police force. But moving back to the events of that night, we can see how things continue. Kushina makes it back to her house and closes the door behind her. She closes all the blinds and turns on soft light as if she were trying to hide from everyone that she was home. Entering her subconscious, she found Kodama back in his cage. He sat there, his back to her as she approached. Kodama, we need to talk. He didn't respond. She stood there. What you did was too far. You didn't have to beat him half to death. I know. I'm sorry, he said without looking at her. She stood there. So what happened? Why did you flip out like that? Did they really make you that angry? Three little humans disturb the sleeping god? Kodama was silent for a moment. I hate fire. She tried to process the meaning of this. Fire? You hate fire? He still did not look at her. I hate fire. I saw a lot of it in my younger years. Fire of war. Fire that burned down my village. The fire of those who killed my Kana. She stood there and listened. They dredged something up. He nodded. The way they acted. They threatened you and attacked with fire. I didn't know where I was at the time. I was just scared they would take you away again. She walked to the locked gate. I'm not going anywhere, Kurama. You and I are one now. We inhabit the same body, so as long as we're together, they can't hurt us. She unlocked the cage and opened it up. She stepped in and walked to face him. He looked away from her shamefully. She stood up on her tiptoes and kissed his large nose. I'm here, Kurama. I'm not going anywhere. Now, want to come back out with me? He nodded. Yes. Back outside of her subconscious, he took his human form again. The ears he had always had so much of an issue hiding were still there atop of his head, but now they drooped in a sorrowful manner. His tail just dragged slowly across the ground as he continued avoiding eye contact. She sat there. Don't be so ashamed, Kurama. I'm not upset. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Kurama's ears stood in fear at the sound. He scrambled to find his hat. He put it on backwards, so quick he didn't even know which way it was facing. The nearest blanket he pulled around his waist to hide his tails. Kushina stepped to the door and slid it open slowly and peeked out. Blonde hair and blue eyes stared back at her through the crack. Minato? she asked. He stood there. Please let me come in. She looked back at Kurama and then back to Minato. Why? Minato's face showed concern. Because we almost killed four people and need to talk about what happened. She shook her head. Just go home, Minato. Forget everything you saw. It doesn't concern you. She tried to close the door, but he put his foot between the door and the jam. Just forget what I saw? I can't forget that. I've been trying to wrap my head around it for a while. I need to know what it is or it's going to drive me nuts. Let me in. She sighed for a moment and undid the latch, letting him in. She closed the door behind him and locked it. Minato stepped into the abode and looked around. He then walked into the same room as Kurama. He stepped over to the orangish, red-haired boy and stopped, standing just above him. He raised his hand slowly and lifted his hat from his head. I knew it. He turns around with an accusatory finger. So you are housing Kutsuna here. She grips his finger, pushes it down, and raises her finger to her lips. Shush, you don't understand half what you're talking about. He stood there as a candle crackled. Then explain it to me. For the next hour, she begrudgingly explained the situation to him. How she had become Lady Mito's successor and was currently the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, and how Inari Uzumaki was the Nine Tails. How his name was truly Kurama. Minato sat and listened, his gaze alternating between the fox-eared boy and the serious expression of Kushina, who was spilling all this information to him. Minato began to ask questions when she was finished with her exposition. The first thing he asked was, If he's the Ninetales, why is he not... hateful? Why hasn't he tried to destroy the village? Have you just been keeping him on a tight leash? She shook her head. Those are just stories, just one side of things. As I tried to say in class earlier, there's a kind side to the Nine Tails that my people recorded in their history that they don't teach here. Kurama was originally a kami of agriculture from which Inari was idealized. Many people even called the Nine Tails Inari. He was the god of agriculture, farming, rice, blacksmiths, and anything else that could be used to prosper. He only unleashed his wrath when he felt he had to. But that's all anyone seems to remember of him. Minato looked back. And he's now inside of you? Kushina nodded. They wanted me to be his vessel. A cage with which he can't escape and can be used whenever I want. But the thing is, I like him. You like him? Minato asked. Kushina nodded. He's my friend. It took time for me to get used to him, but ever since he's been a friend of mine. When I got kidnapped by Kumo, I said that I was rescued by Inari. 
That's only a half-truth. When I was captured, I undid the seal and Kurama came out to save me. He helped me escape. He's protecting me. Minato nodded. He returned to Kurama and offered a slight bow of respect. Forgive me for not recognizing you earlier, Lord Kurama. Kurama looked out of the corner of his eye. Kushina scratched the back of her head and smiled through the awkwardness. There's no need to do that, Minato. Kurama raised his hand. No, no, let him continue. Minato raised himself up. I will help you keep your secret. You have my word. Kurama offered a slight nod and Kushina offered a smile. Minato stayed with them for dinner under Kushina's invitation. Oh, it was more like an order. She ordered him to stay for dinner. And so he did. It was through this that he got to witness the relationship that she had with Kurama. After dinner, he watched as Kurama took the form of a tiny fox kit and crawled into Kushina's lap where he stretched out and let her scratch him and rub his belly. Kurama laid there in his lap and felt for a single moment that he was back in time, hundreds of years ago when Kana was alive, back when she would feed and coddle him. He almost seemed to fall asleep in her lap. Minato seemed to enjoy this. Cool secret, it's like we're part of an exclusive club now or something. Kushina looked up at him. A secret club. Remember, it's secret. He nodded as he stood. I'll keep it secret, don't worry. He would bid them both farewell and would head to leave. The entire village will know by tomorrow, Kurama said bluntly. You're not she began to say, but stopped. Yeah, you're probably right. Kurama sat there. Why does it matter if they know, though? He asked. Kushina struggled. I'm not supposed to take the seal off for you. If they know you're free to leave whenever you want, at best they'll force me to seal you back up. At worst, he looked up to her. She shook her head. Minato promised not to say anything, so we'll be fine. And yes, they were fine. Minato was an excitable young chap, but if he gave his word on something, he would keep his word. He didn't say a single thing to anybody about it. Time continued to pass. School days came and went. Kurama and Kushina garnered a bit of a reputation, both earning a title. Kushina was known as the Red Hot Habanero of the Leaf, and Kurama came to be known as the Naga Jalokia. Most kids tended to avoid them at this point, all except for Minato, who had changed desks just to sit next to them. Now, Minato was a skilled shinobi, but he was hardly the only one. Kushina was pretty strong too, mostly thanks to her Uzumaki genes, which earned her a spot as one of the class's elites. But neither of them could compare to Kurama, whose energy wells and experience dwarfed even the teacher's power. Because of this, the three were allowed to graduate early. They'd be put under Jiraiya, the student of Hiruzen. Jiraiya would welcome the trio to his team and start off with a bell test. Now, Jiraiya would be warned about the potential of his team, particularly the power of the one known as Inari Uzumaki, but how strong could they possibly be? Jiraiya would find out when Kurama takes the bells the moment he gets his hands on them. This would obviously upset Jiraiya, as this was meant to be a test to learn what his students could do, and he barely learned anything. He demands a do-over. This time, it takes a little longer, but Kurama still gets the bells relatively easily. Once more, Jiraiya demands a mulligan. This goes on all day until Jiraiya finally resorts to Sage Mode with the help of Fukasaku and Shima, both of whom are startled that Jiraiya would feel the need to utilize them just to beat down a couple of kids at a game of tag. Kushina would ask Kurama to tone it down a little bit. Kurama would smile. But this is the most fun I've had in years. I like this old man. I want to play tag some more. She would laugh. Just dial it back a little so me and Flash over here get a chance to tag him too. Maybe we'll go play tag later. You'll have to give us a head start though. Kurama would nod. Deal. He then proceeds to hold back quite a bit against Jiraiya. Enough for the old sage to really get a move on and keep away long enough for Kushina and Minato to get a shot. They come close many times, but Jiraiya is a slippery one. Kurama comes up behind him and goes to take the bells, but slows down just in time for Jiraiya to notice and dodge. Kurama would fall to the ground. Oh no, I missed. Whatever will I do? As the day comes to an end, Jiraiya is left on the ground panting. You kids really tire me out. He looks at them with a smile. I think we're going to get along just fine. This was the birth of Team Jiraiya. It was during this time that Minato would approach Kurama. Remember that time you almost killed that Chunin? Kurama would look at him and nod. What was that technique you used on him? Minato would ask. Tailed Beast Bomb, a sphere densely packed with chakra. Why? Minato would look down at his hand. I want to do it. Kurama's face pulled into a skeptical smirk. I don't think you can. It's a different kind of attack. I don't think you humans possess the same type of chakra as a tailed beast. Kushina might be able to do it, but I don't think you can. Minato would think. Well, you said it was just densely packed chakra, right? I can probably do that. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, just so long as it has the same effects, right? Kurama shrugged. I guess. Minato seemed to grow excited. Can you show it to me again? Kurama would sigh and form one in his hands. Minato would come close and start to study it. He would write down in his book everything he could learn about it just by looking at it. And when he decides to learn about it through physical interaction, he pokes it. The thing explodes in his face. Kurama would wipe the soot away from his face and snap at Minato. Damn it! 
Don't do stuff like that, you'll get us both killed. Minato, hanging upside down, his trousers caught on a branch, pulled out his notepad and began to write in it. It swirls inside. That's the secret to the technique. It spins. Suddenly, the tree branch snaps and Minato falls. Kurama sighs and leans back against the tree. At first, he was skeptical about all this human interaction, but right now, he was glad he decided to do it. Kushina, Minato, and Jiraiya. These three humans were fun. They were kind. They reminded him of the humans he used to know. They were nothing like Madara or Hashirama. They actually seemed to care about others. He felt that this was the start of something beautiful. Something he never thought he would have again. Something he never thought he would need. Something he thought he would never want. A friendship. The rain pelted his face like a thousand shards of broken glass. His shoes splashed in the puddles of the endless deluge that had gathered on the bridge. Below the struts holding up the bridge were waves of water, crashing into the bridge with such violence that one might fear that the bridge would come down. But nay, the bridge was hardy. It was built by the prideful architects of Amegakade, the village without daybreak. A constant downpour had made the shinobi of Ame particularly good at water nature jutsu. That was bad for Kurama due to his reliance on fire release. But luckily, he had wind release to fall back on. In one hand was his blade, Kogetsune Maru, and in his other was a sickle. As his feet splashed in the water, his body flickered to the left, then the right, then the center of a group of shinobi, where he used his wind release to form a small vortex of wind that would carve up those within it away from the center where he was. The vortex would suddenly run red as the rain began to turn to blood for a short time. Nothing left of those inside the vortex save anything metallic they'd been carrying. As he stood there though, he did not know that an arrow was trained on his back. From a high perch, an Amenin had their bow trained on him. The arrow was pulled back. Suddenly, there was a sound of lightning striking behind the bowman. Kurama smiled, knowing that there was no lightning in this normal rainstorm. The sound was the sonic boom of Konoha's yellow flash making his appearance. The bowman found his perforated body falling into the waves below. Kurama looked back and found Minato giving him a thumbs up. Kurama returned the gesture before calling up to him. Where's Kushina? Minato would shout back to him the same. She's just up ahead. She and Master Jiraiya are surrounded by Amainin. We gotta bring the reinforcements. Kurama nodded and looked behind him to see the other Konoha Nin coming. He raced forward, continuing on his way back to his Jinchuriki. Honestly, the war with Ame was unfortunate. As Kurama had heard, the war was particularly between Konoha, Iwa, and Suna in the form of a three-way brawl. Sadly, Ame was caught right in the middle, being perfectly centered between these two world superpowers. In the past, it was Kurama standing up for the little guy, but right now he was the aggressor. It was no secret that Konoha had started this war. Whether that was on purpose or not was unknown, but foolish pride had kept it going, and Konoha would not let it go. Not now. Not that so many had died for victory. Tsunade and Orochimaru found themselves rushing up beside Kurama. Inari, where's Jiraiya? Tsunade demanded. Kurama raced forward with them, pointing to a particularly intense battle on the bridge further. They're there, sensei. Orochimaru raised his sleeve as he ran, exposing a contract in the form of tattoos on his arm. He bit his thumb and began to weave hand signs before completing the summon. Suddenly, from the waves below shot a massive water moccasin that arched over the bridge. Together, they crashed into the Ame forces. Sadly, Ame wasn't even meant to be involved. But their village had become a battleground for the three great nations, and Hanzo refused to let this slide. And so, what was a war between the three nations became a war between four. And now, more people would die. Tragic, but hardly something Kurama had never seen before, or would never see again. Life was cruel, and the world had taught him that, and now he was going to be cruel back. That was just the endless cycle they were caught in. He wished they could escape it, but how, and who would do it? The only one who could free him was the boy named Hagaromo nearly a millennium ago. He hoped that day came soon, but until then, Kurama would survive, and he would fight to protect what he loved, consequences be damned. Tsunade's strength of a hundred seal covered her body as she jumped into the air and smashed into the ground with such force that the bridge nearly collapsed. This sent a great number of Amenin flying. Kurama, his body coated in a thick red aura, his fox features exposed for those who looked closely enough to see. With great speed, he cleared through them like a bolt of lightning. The Amenin he passed turned to attack, but suddenly burst open from his slashes and perished. It was quite the graphic battle, but it was what one who went to war would expect. Suddenly, Kurama stepped in something. He looked down to see a dark, greenish-brown liquid by his feet. The heck is this? He questioned. Suddenly, he realized. Get back! Suddenly, the masses went up in flames. It was true that Aminin generally had the proper defenses to deal with fire style, but none of them had what it took to deal with Jiraiya's usage of it, as he utilized a form of oil that stuck to one's body like napalm. Even if you were surrounded by water, it would still burn you. 
quite inhumane, but very imaginative. No doubt the brainchild of the master author himself. The Amenin began to retreat towards Amegakure, the walled village. As they did, they would activate dynamite, causing a portion of the bridge to collapse. Those few Konohanin in pursuit that hadn't been caught in the blast would find themselves drowning in the waves below as the bridge collapsed around them. Thankfully, the Sanin and their own personal squads were spared. Jiraiya and Kushina would meet up with the Rochimaru, Tsunade, Minato, and Kurama. Quite the impressive feat, Zinari, Jiraiya said. You too, Minato. I heard you coming before I saw you. Minato scratched the back of his head in embarrassment at the compliment. Kurama came up to Kushina. You're not hurt, are you? You're bleeding. She looked down. Oh, it's nothing. Just some quick stitches and I'll be ready for more. Not so, said the voice of Tsunade. Kushina looked up at her. What? Tsunade continued. I've come to inform you that Hiruzen wants you back. You've been fighting non-stop for months on end. You've already lost 15 pounds. I can see your ribs. I told the Hokage and he wants the three of you back in Konoha ASAP. What about Master Jiraiya? Minato asked. Tsunade looked up at Minato. He will stay with us. We can't leave until Ame surrenders. You three must return though. Godspeed. Kurama was confused, but chose not to question it. He was really only here for Kushina, so he couldn't care less about what happened next. Kushina seemed more than a little upset about this. Can you believe her? I'm perfectly healthy. She's right. We can see your ribs, Kushina, Minato said. She looks at him. And why were you looking at my chest, Minato? His face turned red and he went silent. All the while, Kurama placed his hand on her bleeding wound and closed it with his chakra so they could continue walking. You need to stay healthy, Kushina. Both of our lives depend on it, Kurama said. She raised her finger to argue this point, but she couldn't find a proper place to attack his position from, and upon seeing him look at her out of the corner of his eye, she relented. Fine, but only until I get my weight back up. And so they made their way back to the village, where they checked in and began debriefing. Once everything was squared away, everyone made it to their homes to clean up and rest. The day after, the three of them would meet up to have lunch, where they spoke about the war. How do you think the war is coming in the other nations? Minato asked. Kushina would be reading the paper herself. Apparently, it's going well in our favor. It seems Sakamo Harake is making quite a name for himself. Minato read the article and whistles a long, droning whistle. Do you think he could be even stronger than Jiraiya-sensei? Kushina looked at him. No way! Jiraiya is the strongest, only beaten up by Hiruzen. And Kurama there, Minato said flatly. Kushina nodded. And Kurama, of course. Kurama, meanwhile, was using his second chair as a footstool and leaned back. Nothing beat a good nap to ease digestion. Minato pointed towards another article. What's this here, though? She looked at it. It says there's a mysterious object seen hovering in the skies above the waters between Uzoshio and Kiri. It's been considered a UFO. Kurama looked at them with one eye open. It's probably aliens. She sighed and turned the page. What are you doing now? Minato asked. I'm trying to read my horoscope. See what the future holds. She looked for her sign, cancer. She found it and read it. You will soon be abducted by aliens. Damn. She crumpled the paper and threw it into the trash can. Kurama stood and followed her. Minato was staring. I guess I'll get the tab. As Kurama and Kushina walked on, they looked around the village, just enjoying their time off. Or, well, Kurama was. Kushina was eager to get back to Ame. Kurama shook his head. Why can't you just enjoy your time off, Kushina? Why do you like fighting so much? It's my duty, Kurama, she said. Kurama scoffed. Maybe so, but if I didn't know any better, it seems like you'd rather be fighting right now than enjoying the time off the Hokage ordered you to take. Listen, I've been fighting wars since before you were born. The thing I learned about it is that if you live by the sword, you will eventually die by it. War isn't something you're guaranteed to survive every time you walk into it. Madara was killed. Hashirama was killed. Tobirama was killed. All the previous Kage were killed in battle, and even the other greats. I almost died a couple times. You're not invincible. I know that, she shouted at him. Then why are you doing this, he shouted back. She took a deep breath. You're right about one thing. All the previous Kage died fighting in wars, but they became Kage through war. It's only in the fire that gold becomes pure. I want to prove myself. It's my dream. Kurama relented. Just don't be so headstrong. You know I'll protect you, but don't spread me thin. As they walked on, suddenly there was an eerie quiet. Kurama looked up, his hair standing on end. Something's coming. Kushina looked up too. What's that sound? They listened closely and heard something. Suddenly, strange objects began to fill the air. They looked like birds, but upon closer inspection, they were people. Flying ninja? Kushina asked. Suddenly, round objects began to fall. There were puffs of smoke along with explosions. We're under attack! Kurama covered her and tackled her to the side as he felt himself pelted with shrapnel. He felt it enter his body and lodge itself in his chakra pathway system. His vision began to go dark. All he saw was Kushina kneeling down above him. She called his name, though it was muffled by the shell shock. Her eyes were full of worry and fear. Slowly, he fell unconscious. 
How long he was out, he didn't know. Eventually, he awakened in a makeshift hospital as the original had been destroyed. Minato was sitting there by him as he came to. His body was bandaged from head to toe, burns and shrapnel. The doctors had managed to get most of it out, but his chakra system was still damaged. He looked to Minato. What happened? Minato looked down. We're not sure. The village was attacked by an unknown nation and is currently attempting to figure out what comes next. Kodama then realized that someone had removed his hat and pants, exposing his ears and tail. He almost seemed to panic. Minato calmed him. Don't worry. I explained to them that it's a Kekai Genkai that you got from your father's side. If they ever ask, your father was from an unknown clan named the Shiba clan that originated in the land of woods. Kodama nodded. He sat up. Minato seemed startled by this. You need to rest. Lay back down. Kodama scoffed. Screw rest. I can do whatever I want. Right now, I want to find Kushina. Minato looked away. Kodama looked back at him as he had one leg in his pants. Where is Kushina, Minato? Minato looked up. She was taken by the enemy. They believe it's because she's a Jinchuriki. Kodama quickly got his pants on, slipped into his shoes, threw his jacket over his shoulders, and made his way towards Hiruzen's office. Where is Kushina? He demanded. Hiruzen and the other shinobi in the room were startled by this. Minato, still hanging onto Kurama's legs in an attempt to stop him, stood up and waved him off. Pardon my teammate, Lord Third. Kurama spoke again. Kushina, where is she? Hiruzen waved the other shinobi out of the room and for a moment took his seat by the window. He leaned back in it. Are you sure you should be up and walking around, Inari? I heard that you were nearly killed in the explosion. Kurama looked at him through his eyebrows. That's none of your concern, Hokage. My only concern is Kushina. Hiruzen was a little shocked by the complete and total lack of respect, but he ignored it and spoke. She was taken by the land of the sky. Kodama seemed confused. He'd never heard of this one. Land of sky. Hiruzen nodded. It's a nation, a faction comprised of shinobi of other nations that grew tired of the world system, it seems. They're more like a terrorist state than an actual village. I don't give a damn about the politics of it. I merely wish to know where they are. Currently, they've set up base in the skies over Uzoshio's ruins. It's a flying fortress known as Ancor Vantian. According to our prisoner, they're building a super weapon capable of destroying the five great shinobi nations. Currently, their base is hovering over a swamp in the Land of Fire. It seems like they're trying to get into firing range of Konoha. Kodama nodded and turned around. Hiruzen stopped him. Don't tell me you're planning to go there. Kodama looked back, his eyes giving the answer. Hiruzen raised his hands. I know you're hoping to help your friend, but it's too dangerous. I'm giving you an official order to wait until we have a squad together. Kodama turned around. I only take orders from you because I wish to protect Kushina. I have no loyalty to you or this village. My only loyalties are to her. I'm going to save her. I wouldn't try to stop me if I were you. Hiruzen looked into the boy's eyes and understood. How long have you been out? He turned to leave. I'm finding my Kushina. Kushina woke up in a cell. Across the hall from her was another cell where stood others. A few of them were wounded shinobi, but most were merely civilians. Where am I? She asked. A civilian perked up. You're inside the Land of Skies Flying Fortress. She tried to make sense of this. She leaned closer to the bars. Is everyone okay over there? Are there any wounded? The civilian looked over. We have a few Konoha shinobi who have been mortally wounded. They allowed us to wrap them, but they'll die without medical attention. Kushina cursed under her breath. Suddenly, they heard the doors open. She came up to her knees and looked to see a shinobi with a strange symbol on their headband. It appeared like the same symbol that Konoha used, but heavily modified. Then, a man in a long black trench coat, not too unlike that worn by Konoha's intelligence division, walked in. He possessed a deep brown, almost black beard and hair like a lion's mane, a fearsome monster of a man. The shinobi nearby hailed him with a hearty salute. He came to her and knelt down to her level. I see my men were correct. What a fortunate find, he said. She scoffed. Could you be any closer, Ganondorf? I can smell what you had for lunch. He laughed. This one's got spunk. I love it when they're like this. It makes it all the better when I steal their will to live. She laughed. How many times did you practice that cliche in front of the mirror, huh? He smiled. It's fortunate that you're a Jinchuriki, and a Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails, no less. Your tailed beast will feed ours quite well. Then we'll use it to destroy your village. She seemed curious. Your tailed beast? What tailed beast do you have? Who are you? You're not Iwa, and you're not Suna. The man stood. I am Shino, the supreme leader of the land of the sky. And to answer your question, we have a tailed beast, the Zero Tails. Kushina's face crinkled up in judgment. If it's got zero tails, then why do you even call it a tailed beast? You should just call it a beast and be done with it. The supreme leader laughed. I think we're done here. Prepare her to be siphoned. He stepped out. Kushina looked up. Damn. 
My horoscope came true. Kodama had gathered his things and began to leave the village, heading in one particular direction. Minato was also carrying his things. So, how do you know which way they went? Oh, did you cross-reference their position for the newspaper with the position Hiruzen gave us to measure time and direction to come up with the location? Kodama looked behind him. What? No, I'm just tracking the chakra they left behind. Minato seemed more than a little confused. They walked for hours and hours. Eventually, they needed to stop. Not because Kodama needed it, but because he knew Minato did. And so they sat down and waited. As he rested, Minato would come up to him. Hey, can you teach me how to make a tailed beast ball again? Kurama looked up. I told you, unless you have tailed beast chakra, it just won't happen. Minato nodded. Yeah, but I want to try anyway. Just a variation at least. A general shape. Kurama sighed. He held out his hand and a purple sphere appeared. Minato held out his hands and began attempting to do the same. It just puffed. Kurama shook his head. No, you've got to keep it dense and compact, but keep it spinning. It should spin the direction that your chakra naturally flows. Try again. Minato tried again, but had not much more success. This is a lot harder than it seems. How do you do it? Kurama thought about it. I've been capable of doing it for so long that I've kind of completely forgot. It takes control and precision. Try breaking it up into steps. It consists of two parts, control and power. Master each separately and then try to combine them. He gave Minato a water balloon. Try to spin the contents of that balloon. Minato took it and began to practice. Then what? Kurama looked at him. If you can master that quickly, then try to make the balloon pop to test your power. If you can do both those things, just do them together and you should make a tailed beast ball or a tiny weak human ball or whatever you plan to call it. Minato kept attempting the teachings. I'll name it later. The next day, they continued to head out. They came to a river of gently flowing water. How will we get down this? Minato asked. Kurama brought Kugetsune Maru to bear and used it to cut down a tree. He threw it into the river and jumped down onto it. Minato would follow him. They would float down the river. In the distance, they saw the fortress shining like a city in the sky. The closer they got, the more they heard the sound of the flying machines that were being used. They floated closer to the fortress. Eventually, they got out of the water and climbed up on a riverbank. They made it closer. Kurama looked up. How do we get in? He asked. Minato looked too. Uh, I can get us in, but we'd need one of my kunai up there. Think you can do that? Kurama beckoned for his kunai. Minato handed it to him, and Kurama reared back his arm and threw it as hard as he could. The kunai went up into the air. Minato then extended his arm as Kurama was rolling his aching shoulder. Grab my hand now. Kurama looked back. I would if I didn't totally miss. Minato was shocked. Wait, you missed? Kurama nodded and pointed. It landed in the forest, way over there. Minato seemed depressed. That was specially made. It cost me so much. Kurama looked back. Just mark a regular kunai and let me throw it. Minato mumbled in aggravation, but he did as was bidden. Kurama took the second kunai and threw it. I think that one worked. He then took Minato's hand. The two of them teleported. As soon as they did, they found themselves on the steps of the flying fortress. They began to make their way through. Kurama stopped them and looked back. This is a big fortress. There are too many people to sense. We should split up. You go that way and I'll take this one. If you find her, get out and send me a signal. Minato stood for a moment. What kind of signal? Kurama thought for a moment. I don't know. Just do something. Minato shook his hand and put a mark on another kunai. Take this. I'll teleport to you when the mission's complete. He then made his way off. Kurama looked at the kunai and flipped it, bringing it to bear in his hands as he made his way through. Minato kept close to the walls, his eyes open. He continued to make his way down to the lower floors. The guard was a bit heavier here. As he made his way through, he found the prison area. There were two guards standing there. They looked armored enough to be protected from his weapons, so he needed another idea. He pulled out two kunai and stepped around the corner. The Sky Shinobi saw him. Intruder! They ran at him. Minato ran back towards them with his kunai ready. His enemies raised their blades. As Minato closed the distance though, his next actions were surprising. He discarded his kunai, one to the corner of the room and one out through the window. The shinobi were startled by this just enough that he could slide under their blows. The moment he did, he grabbed their legs and raised two fingers and suddenly utilized the flying raijin technique to teleport to the kunai that was in the midst of freefall. He grabbed it and let go of the shinobi he was holding and raised his fingers again to teleport to the kunai he discarded in the corner of the room. Once he was back, he collected it and also made his way to the next area. The door creaked open and he made his way through the cells and found two rows, one full of people and one completely empty on the other side. He came to the door and looked in at the prisoners. Hey, have you seen a girl about my age? Red hair? Fiery personality? The prisoners nodded. Yes, Supreme Leader Shino took her to the throne room to power their super weapon to destroy Konoha. Minato nodded. All right, thanks. The civilian called out to him. Will you let us go? Minato came back to the door. Oh, of course. His eyes just went wide when he realized that he didn't take the keys from the guards when he killed them. 
Kurama made his way through the base. He hid in an alcove as a few shinobi passed by. He stepped out and continued to sneak through. He found a rather large room. He almost passed it by, but stopped and returned when he saw Kushina. Kurama stepped in. There, across from him, at the far end of the large room was a man of incredible size and power, sitting on a throne, his hands and arms covered in large gauntlets. A visitor, he said with a smile. Another child. If Konoha's hedging its future on the success of a teenager, then I feel I might not even be needed to bring them to an end. As he stood there, he spoke. Give me back Kushina. Do whatever the hell you want to Konoha. I just want her back. Shino began to laugh. Oh, is this love? You really came here to confront the most powerful man in the world because of love? Kurama didn't budge. This man was nothing to him and he knew it. All he needed to do was prove that. Dr. Shino stepped forward. As heroic as that sounds, I fear you have a date with the Reaper. Dr. Shino dropped his cloak, exposing his torso. This was to Kushina's surprise as she averted her eyes, refusing to admit that this man was cut like a diamond. Kurama wasn't intimidated. Does removing your clothes somehow power you up, tiny man? Shino shook his head. No, I was just tired of ripping all my shirts. Suddenly, his muscles bulged even more. Kurama was amazed at the level of chakra this man suddenly had. What is this? He demanded. Shino pushed his hair back over his shoulders. This is the eighth gate of death. Kushina called out to him. Liar! No one can use the eighth gate and live. He looked back at her and smiled. How foolish. This is the power of the Zero Tails. It's dark chakra with my medical expertise. I am a doctor, you know. And I pioneered a new form of regeneration that makes use of biofeedback. I call it the body revival technique. I'm using the Zero Tail's endless supply of chakra to fuel my regeneration, which in turn allows me to ignore the effects of the 8th gate while using it to its fullest potential. Kurama smiles. Interesting. A powerful technique indeed. Too bad it won't save you. Shino crosses his arms. I guess there's only one way to find out. Kurama rushes him and kicks at him, only to find it completely ignored by this man. Kurama's knocked back. He stands there in awe that his strike did nothing. How could this man even survive such a strike, let alone ignore it? He formed a tailed beast ball in his hand and rushed forward with it, smashing Shino in the face. Kurama's smirk turned to terror when he saw Shino standing there without even a scratch. Shino smiled. My turn. He grabbed Kurama by the hair and lifted him up, striking him so hard that he flew through the wall. Kushina cried out for him. Kurama! Kurama lays there. His, his chest and stomach begins to turn purple as he vomits up blood. Kurama can't even watch him anymore. He lays there and wonders if he's going to die. Well, he can't stay dead, but if he did die there, it would take him so long to regenerate that Kushina would already be dead. So it would be a fate worse than death. A world without Kushina. Kurama manages to stand, his chakra working overtime to heal his broken ribs and ruptured internal organs. His form becomes more feral. Shino looks at him and remarks upon his dog-like appearance. It's funny that you should love the nine-tailed fox's Jinchuriki, especially considering that you yourself are a fox. Aren't you afraid of competition? That it just might edge you up? He stopped for a moment and looked back at Kushina and then once again at Kurama. No way. You're the actual Ninetales, aren't you? Oh, that's even more romantic. Sadly, there'll be no happy endings for you. I will bring you to death's door and then feed you to the Zero Tails. Kurama smiles defiantly, as if a mere human could do that to me. Once more, they rush into battle. Kurama jumps to strike Shino, but Shino catches him mid-air and holds him up by his throat. Shino scoffs. This is the power of the Nine Tails? This is pathetic. I don't even need the Eight Gates to kill you. He begins to laugh. Suddenly, in a flash of lightning, Minato appears due to Kurama's kunai he'd been holding. Sukoro Hakai no Ningen Chikara Ken, he shouts as he pushes his replica-tailed beast ball into Shino's mouth, letting it detonate. As the smoke clears, Shino is standing there, his mouth wide open in an unnatural way. Minato stands. Sorry, didn't mean to knock your jaw off. Shino's brow furrows as he grabs his jaw and pops it back into place. You're going to die a horrible death for that. Shino's body flickers and he appears behind the yellow flash, to the point where even Minato couldn't see it. Minato raises his arms and legs to shield himself quickly and is knocked away. He hits the wall at an angle and bounces off. He lays there for a moment before shaking his head and standing. Wow, that one tickled. Deep down, he felt as if he had a stress fracture in his arm, leg, and three of his ribs. But he was hiding the pain just so he could insult this man. Flipping his kunai in his hand, he got down into a proper position. Okay, round two. Kushina, still chained down, cried out for Kurama. Please, Kurama, you have to get up. We need you. Minato came at Shino using his speed. He was already learning to outmaneuver and avoid Shino's attacks. His speed may have been greater before, but all Minato had to do was increase the chakra flow to his legs through lightning nature, and suddenly he was a literal bolt of lightning. 
He hit Shino in the chest with his knee before striking out at him five times, all while still in the air. The moment Shino went to strike him, he dodged back. Shino grabbed Minato by the leg and pulled him up. He punched him again before turning and throwing him at the throne, shattering it. Let's see you run now, you little twit. Kushina then cried out, Kurama, please, Minato's gonna die. Shino walked over to see Minato curled up on the floor. He knelt down. Have you ever seen what it's like when you squeeze a man's head until it pops? It's like a balloon covered in bone. Let me show you. His hand stopped short of Minato's head. He stopped and turned around, seeing Kurama standing there, face twisted in rage. Shino stood, feeling the chakra change. Is this finally going to be a bit more interesting? Kurama had golden wisps of chakra leaving his body. Shino laughed. Please, tell me you plan to kill me. It would make a perfect epitaph for you. Kurama roared as his body was consumed in chakra, entering his chakra mode. He rushed forward at incredible speeds. His fist clashed with Shino's. Shino looked down at the fists and grunted for a second before looking back up at Kurama and smiling. Okay then, entertain me, fox boy. He grabs Kurama's arm and throws him towards the wall. Kurama lands on the wall, rolls along it, and jumps, throwing a tailed beast ball at Shino. Shino takes the shot, but this time it knocks him into the wall as well, leaving an obvious mark. While this was going on, Minato crawled over to Kushina and cut her free with his kunai. We gotta stop him, Minato said. Kushina helped him up. His source of power is the Zero Tails. He keeps it locked below us in a containment area. If we can destroy it, then his power will fade. Minato nodded and let her help him to the containment area. Shino hardly noticed. He was too focused on his fight. Perhaps I underestimated you, Demon Fox. Show me what it is to be a god of destruction. Kurama rushed at him, his ears lengthening and eight more tails appearing from behind his back, each one swiping out at Shino with incredible force. Below, Minato and Kushina could hear the fight. Hurry, we need to do this. They looked up and saw a massive containment seal. It appeared to be a massive leech entombed in a cocoon of slime that was suspended in the air by a spider web. The spider web possessing tags not too dissimilar from the ones that had been put on her. Minato held out his hand and formed another orb. Uh, just calling it a spiraling sphere for now. He tried to make it as big as possible. Kushina held out her hand too and used her considerable chakra well to fuel it and make it into a massive big ball Rasengan. Do your best. Jump. Like a bolt of lightning, he was in the air. Stopping just above the creature, he smashed the Rasengan into it. Suddenly, the ball burst, knocking everyone back. In the fight above, Shino stood there, stepping towards Kurama, who was on the ground, having dropped out of chakra mode. This really was shameful. I thought a god was supposed to be strong, Shino said. My mistake. He stepped towards Kurama to finish him off. Suddenly, the ground below him buckled as a little part of it fell in. He managed to miss it. He stepped back and felt his source of dark chakra vanish. Without the fuel to keep his regeneration going, it slowly began to fail, his hair turning white and falling out of his head as his body and musculature began to deteriorate at an increased speed. He quickly cancelled his transformation to keep from dying. Hitting his knees, he looked up at Kurama, who was standing above him with a scowl of disapproval. Kurama spoke. Yes, your mistake. He raised his hand and struck him down. All the while, Minato and Kushina utilized Flying Raijin to escape to where the civilians had been outside the fortress. They looked up to see the fortress falling. Suddenly, it ruptured, the Ninetales' true form appearing from within, shattering it. The fortress fell to earth. Kushina cried out, Kurama! She rushed towards the ruins. She stopped by it and looked around in the wreckage. She began trying to dig through. She was crying, her fingers bleeding from how hard she was digging. The other civilians began to pitch in. Eventually, even Konoha's forces, led by Hiruzen himself, who would show up and begin helping with search and rescue. They began to excavate deeper until they exposed Kurama, laying there battered and bruised. She came to his side and listened for a heartbeat. It was there. She sighed with relief and then burst into tears. Slowly, Kurama's eyes opened. Kana. She just looked down at him. Kurama, you're okay. She held him close. He smiled. I'm just glad you're safe. She smiled and seemingly passed out. When he next awoke, he was in a makeshift hospital, a repurposed inn for lodging. His regeneration kicking in, he managed to stand and make his way out to the balcony where he witnessed the sun setting. He stood there silently until eventually a voice came from behind. Kurama. He looked back to see Kushina standing there. He smiled. She walked out to him. Why did you go out of your way to save me? She asked. You wouldn't have perished if I died, and you're not loyal to Konoha, so why did you rescue me? He took a deep breath. Because you mean more to me than anything. I told you about Kana. I never thought I would care for anything again like I did for her. I didn't account for you. She smiled. You said I was her. Kurama nodded. You are, and you possess so much in common. 
but that's not how reincarnation works. You're not an exact duplicate. You may have been Kana in the past, but you're Kushina now. Entirely new. Entirely unique. And yet, I still love you. She smiled at his words. It took me time to realize it, but I love you too, Kurama. As the sun set on this day, the two shared a kiss. The sun also began to set on another chapter of Kurama's life. The chapter of loss. The chapter of hatred. Kurama had regained what he had lost and was all the more joyous for it. By this time though, his true identity had been discovered. The demon fox walked among them, but it was not threatening. There were some in the village who were terrified. Some who petitioned Hiruzen to have Kushina stripped of him and to have him sealed into a new, more trustworthy vessel. But Kurama had friends in the village too. Those who trusted and respected him. And Hiruzen was one of them. It was Hiruzen's decision to leave Kurama alone, but it was also Hiruzen who convinced the people that Kurama was benevolent. While there were naturally some who feared him, as great power, no matter who wields it, brings fear, they wouldn't move against him. Minato was a bit heartbroken by this, but he too would one day find love. On a mission to the Land of Wind, Minato would find himself in a far-off kingdom named Roran, where he would manage to save the queen, a woman named Sara, from a criminal who had somehow transported himself through time from the future. Following after him was a young shinobi that Minato would recognize as his own son in the future. Having saved the queen and her people, the kingdom fell to ruin from the battle. It was then that Minato discovered his love for Sara. Kurama courted Kushina for a while, swooning head over heels. Eventually, the two would marry, but alas, the third shinobi world war begins and continues to rage on. Will Kurama have time to enjoy his newfound love, or is it his fate to endlessly suffer? A widower of war. Now, as for the recap, Kurama had lived near a village that he loved, and within that village was a girl that he also loved. She was kind to him and showered him with affection. He felt this love and returned it, and eventually the two were married, Kurama and his beloved Kana. But tragedy strikes in the form of an angry sword when wars break out. It is the great feudal era that took place just after the sage's demise. And while Kurama does his best to control the damage, acting as a judge between the warring states, his home village is attacked and his wife and unborn child are killed, leaving the fox bitter. He would later be found by Madara and used until his sealing into Mito. As the years pass, Kurama begins to lose hope. That is until he's sealed into a new vessel, a young girl named Kushina. Kodama at first is hostile, but this girl's overwhelming desire to learn more about the fox leads to a discovery Kodama never expected. She was the reincarnation of his beloved Kana. This causes him to open up more, to the point that the two become friends. And after freeing Kushina from the grip of Kumogakure's shinobi, he would come to live with her under the name Inari Uzumaki. The two would end up becoming shinobi, and alongside Minato Namakaze, become members of Team Jiraiya. They would set off for the war where they'd fight in Amegakure alongside the legendary Sanin until fatigue set in so hard that they could not safely continue. They return to Konoha to rest and recover, but suddenly their village is attacked by the village hidden in the sky and Kushina is taken. Kurama, who had been wounded, awakens and sets off to rescue her, where he would end up facing off against the Sky Ninja and boarding their super weapon, and Corvantian, where Kurama would battle against the supreme leader Shino in an attempt to stop him and save Kushina. This is successful, but as the fortress falls from the sky, Kurama is caught in the crash and left buried under the rubble for a long time, grievously wounded. He's returned to the village, and it's here that Kushina and Kurama share their first kiss. Time. It flies by. Unseen, it passes forward, its cosmic arms ticking across the clock of destiny. For humans, it seemed like so long, but for a creature of such a long lifespan as Kurama, the fourth dimension was more easily seen, its effects becoming more noticeable to him. Love was a sensation he once hated. He possessed it once, and it was so cruelly taken from him, but now he had it again. He had taken her hand in marriage. Such a strange relationship, a prisoner and a human sacrifice finding love in each other's arms. It was not long after this unity of hearts that another blessing was given to them. A third heart to love. Kurama was surprised when he heard. He was scared. He almost had a panic attack. But her soothing touch reminded him that everything was going to be alright. Together they spoke of the child, what to name it, when suddenly she seemed to change the subject. Did you read the newest novel Master Jiraiya wrote? Kurama's brow twisted in confusion as he was unsure why it was that she would jump to such a strange topic out of the blue, but he humored her. No, I didn't even know he made one. Kushina seemed horrified at the lack of care Kurama was displaying. He sent it to us and even signed it as a gift. The tale of the utterly gutsy shinobi, she said. Kurama thought back. Oh, that. 
I did read that. Thought it was garbage. Didn't know Jiraiya wrote it. Kushina rubbed her face. It was true that this was far from Jiraiya's bestseller. In fact, he could hardly get anyone to buy it. He was basically giving them away, vowing that he would never write anything but Lemon for the rest of his life. She looked it over. The story maybe could have been a little better, but the heart was there. The motivations and the drive of the main character to... To never give up? Kurama asked. He pulled the book to him. Naruto was the best part of that book. I would have enjoyed seeing him in another novel. Probably one not written in crayon. Kushina almost laughed, but stifled it before she showed any cruel disrespect to her sensei. Naruto was one of the best protagonists I've ever seen. His conviction almost seems impossible, but somehow it worked. That's why I want to name our son after him. Kurama rolled his head back. Kushina. We're not naming our son after a fish cake. She huffed. Then what was your idea? He thought for a second. Kurama too. Kushina's gaze felt like he had just swallowed a thousand needles. Fish cake is good. The two continued their journey into love and parenting, Kurama spending this time ever by her side. He was still a member of Konoha's military forces. Kushina received time off from the war due to her pregnancy, but Kurama did not. But did that stop him from staying by her side? Nope. Kurama just decided to go AWOL. I mean, what could they do to him? He was their nuclear deterrent. After everything they had done to him, they were lucky he hadn't turned his guns on them. Perhaps Hiruzen knew that, too, because he didn't push it further. Kurama, on the few days he actually did bother to report in, seemed a little nervous. Stressed. He snapped, and his wit was sharpened to a razor edge. His aggression was something Hiruzen had come to understand from Kushina, who had been secretly cleaning up after Kurama's messes from behind. Hiruzen realized that Kurama had previously seen himself conceive a child with a previous lover during a war, and it was while he was away at war that both his love and his child were slaughtered. He was obviously fighting through some pain, despite the joyous occasion of conception. Hiruzen would sit by the fox during one of their conversations. What's bothering you? You don't have to leave her side anymore if you don't want to, so why are you upset? Kurama didn't want to speak. Hiruzen sat forward. I know we've never really been friends. Konoha has done some things that I look back upon now and realize were very cruel, but I want to be better. I want bygones to be bygones. I want to try, at the very least, to be your friend. So tell me what's wrong. Kurama looked at the elderly man. In the time since the Second Shinobi World War, Hiruzen's age had truly caught up with him. His face had wrinkled, his hair had turned white and mostly fallen out. But along with age came wisdom, and there were times when Kurama believed that he never needed to speak. Hiruzen would just know. But this time, whether Hiruzen truly knew or not, he asked him anyway. Kurama did not wish to state it, but he had felt that his relationship to Hiruzen had become closer to friends than it previously had been. Kurama opened his mouth and went to start, but couldn't. He took a deep breath and then started again. I've been having nightmares. Hiruzen watched on. These bad dreams, what are they? Kurama looked up, his expression hardening, but not in anger, in fear, death, death. Hiruzen watched on, his own expression showing concern. Kurama continued, I see Kushina. She's giving birth, and, and she dies. I see blood, so much blood, and the baby. It Kurama had not noticed yet that a couple tears were rolling down his cheeks. It dies too. Hiruzen sat forward and put his hand on Kurama's shoulder. It's okay, Kurama. A dream is just a dream. It means nothing. Kurama looked up. Not for me. I dream prophetically. Hiruzen nodded, understanding his plight. She'll be fine. I have the greatest doctors on hand. Kurama shook his head. No, in my dreams, it's not because of the birth that they die. Someone kills them. Hiruzen's brow furrows. She's murdered while giving birth? Hiruzen was wondering if this dream was merely a manifestation of the beast's previous trauma. But at the same time, he wanted to put his friend at ease. It's okay. I won't let it happen to you. You've done so much for our village. I would be happy to do something for you. I will provide the best doctors and give her a personal guard. He pushes himself into Kurama's gaze. Listen, this time is a joyous one, Kurama. You're about to become a father. When Kushina gives birth, I want you to be happy. So let me do all the worrying, okay? Kurama would agree. Time would continue to tick on, mercilessly. Kurama would be out walking the streets with Kushina. He'd be on her everywhere she went. For Kushina, the concept of personal space was lost, as at all times, his arms were rubbing up against her. More than once, she accidentally stepped out of her shoe because Kurama had accidentally stepped on the heel. It came to the point that he even attempted to follow her into the women's restroom. She had to push him back and demand a little privacy. 
As sweet as it was, it was smothering. Today was no different. She'd be gathering groceries, all while her large, imposing husband's gaze dared anyone to even look in her direction. Makoto Uchiha was the only one confident enough to approach. It seems daddy mode's been activated. I remember when I had my first child. Fugaku's Sharingan never shut off. Kushina laughed. Yeah, Kurama just can't let me out of his sight. Makoto and Kushina would talk and joke a while longer, most of it at Kurama's expense. But as they began to come to a good place to get up the conversation, Kushina's smile faded. Makoto seemed confused by the look on her face. Kurama was looking down at the ground as a dark circle was forming around her legs. Kushina, did you just pee? Makoto looked down. Kushina shook her head. No, um, uh, that was... My water just broke. Kurama looked confused. Your water broke? What does that mean? Makoto looked up at him. It means the baby's coming. Kurama's eyes went wide. The baby's coming? No, tell it to wait. It can't come now. Kushina stood there looking back at him. I don't think either of us have a choice now, Kurama. So he picked her up. Kurama picked her up. He began to rush off. Makoto called out. Where are you going? Kurama looked back. Home. She's gonna have a baby. Makoto squeezed her temples. No, numbnuts. Go to the hospital where the doctors are. Kurama turned around and began to run in that direction. As soon as they entered, Hiruzen would send out the best doctors to her and give her a personal guard. As she went into labor, she began to cry out as she tried to give birth to their firstborn. Kurama, all the while, didn't realize just how brutal nature was. He was a force of nature yet, but even he had to admit that this was horrible. Eventually, the baby was delivered. They snipped the umbilical cord and cleaned it up a little before presenting it to Kushina and Kurama. The baby wailed and wailed, its fox ears sticking straight up, a tail curled up. Kushina held the child close, crying for joy. Kurama was looking at it. This is my cub? She nodded. This is our baby, Kurama. He looked at her. Fish cake. You wanted me to name it Fish Cake. He looked at the nurses. The baby's name is Fish Cake. Kushina sat up, feeling the pain, but also the necessity. No, no, he means Naruto. We're naming it Naruto. The nurse flipped around the pencil and began to erase what they had written down, beginning again. Kurama stood there for a moment, his hand gently caressing the skin of his new child. It bore resemblance to the human form Kurama had taken, but also bore the same features he had issues hiding. He could sense from within this babe a powerful presence, a powerful chakra, his chakra. This child, despite being human, was also a tailed beast. Suddenly, he heard cries from behind as one of the nurses stood there, wielding a blade. Kurama stepped between the nurse and his family. The nurse turned to face him, the transformation dropping and showing a masked man in a cloak. I expected it to be harder than this. He stepped forward as Kurama brought his claws to bear. The masked man stopped. I've come to take a tailed beast. It can be you, her, or the child. It matters not. I'm here to take one of you. Kurama launched at the man and attempted to strike him down, but felt himself pass clean through. He turned back to see. The man would be standing there, kunai in hand. I would prefer to have you, Nine Tails, but I'll gladly take the child. It's half-tailed beast itself, so if I take it and extract all of its chakra from it, I've essentially got what I came for. You can have back whatever's left. Kurama stepped forward. No, please, don't. The man turned the single hole in his mask toward Kurama to get a better view. Oh? Kurama fell to his knees. Please, I beg you, do not take my Kushina or my Naruto. If you must take one of us, take me. The masked man would smile, the expression on his face only visible through his eye. He'd step forward and grab Kurama by the neck. Kushina cried out for him, but in the end he was taken, teleported away to some unknown location. It was then that the Anbu rushed in with Hiruzen. What happened? He asked. Kushina couldn't even respond. She was so frazzled. Kurama had been taken to a cave. He opened his eyes to see the masked man standing there, but to his surprise, another was standing there too, one who possessed the Rinnegan. For a moment, he thought he was looking at the Sage of Six Paths. Who, who are you? He asked the shadowy figure possessing the Rinnegan. They did not respond. You've taken the Ninetales. What do you plan on doing with him now? You can't put him into the ghetto statue as it is now. The masked man, still gripping Kurama, spoke. We'll put him into a deep slumber until we can get him in the statue. Kurama was left there in shock. He gazed into the Rinnegan without cease. He had only witnessed those eyes once in his years upon years of life. There was no doubt those were the sage's eyes, but how? The sage of six paths had died, right? Or were these eyes stolen from the sage? Was it possible that this was the sage of six paths reincarnation? Father? Kurama called to the man with the Rinnegan. Before he could get an answer, he suddenly felt drowsy and fell asleep. Back in Konoha, they were still investigating. Who could have done this? 
Kushina, still in shock, cradled her baby and gave it all the tender love and care it required while fighting back tears. He's okay, she reassured herself. He will be okay. She knew this must be true. A part of him resided within her at all times now, and though it was not enough to carry his personality, they hoped to use her to find a way to track Kurama. But strangely, no matter what they tried, they couldn't pinpoint his location. All they could do was continue investigating the masked man. They asked Kushina what she remembered, and she stated that it was surprisingly little, merely the type of mask he was wearing. But that helped them very little, as a mask could be changed. They began to reach a dead end. It seemed that they would never find him. The trail went cold, and so Kushina did the only thing she could do. She carried on with her life. The village vowed to never stop its search, but they didn't have anything to go on, so a breakthrough in the case never happened. Kushina would eventually get home and realize the truth of how lonely it was. The halls were quieter, the bed was colder, the food she ate for dinner tasted bland. It was as if the entire world had lost its color, and she was left in a monochrome reality where the only bright spot that existed was Naruto. Minato had been working hard to find Kurama. Eventually, Orochimaru would be discovered as having been killing and dissecting members of the village. This surprised Kushina. She had fought alongside him in the war, so his sudden defection surprised her. Despite her sorrow, she always had the help of Makoto by her side. As they spent time together, their children would too. Sasuke and Naruto would find themselves playing quite a bit. Naruto would grow to develop a friendship with Sasuke and the two would attend the academy together. While in the academy, they would also befriend a boy named Menma Namakaze, the son of Minato. Naruto was not very intelligent, but he did possess natural skill, which included transformation jutsu. He also seemed to have an affinity for fire style and wind style jutsu, as well as genjutsu. These traits his mother attributed to Kurama. In school, Naruto would often be made fun of due to possessing fox ears and a tail. One of his classmates, Kiba Inazuka, even joked that he should become one of the Inazuka clan's ninken. Naruto would grow self-conscious about these things. While he was good at the transformation jutsu, he never could hide his ears and tail, no matter what form he took. So he often included a hat into the transformation and would also hide his tail. One day, he returns home and asks his mother why he's the only person with an extra set of ears and a tail. She would tell him that he inherited them from his father, Kurama. She would tell him stories and show him pictures as he never had a chance to know his father. And on the inevitable day that he would meet him, she wanted Naruto to know who he was. Naruto would eventually ask where his father went and why he's not around anymore. Kushina would merely state the truth. He had been taken. Where he was now, she didn't know. She told them that she spent every day looking for clues, keeping close with the intelligence team, but for some reason they never heard anything about the masked man. It was as if he were a ghost. Naruto would lament knowing that his father was missing. As he continued to study in the academy, the time would come that he was to graduate. When asked to use the clone transformation jutsu, he tended to fail. Not because it didn't work, but because he always had to add a hat to hide the ears. However, they would pass him anyway, especially when he made use of the tailed beast bomb, which would be mistaken for the Rasengan, an A-class jutsu. He'd eventually be put on a team beside Menma and Sasuke, all three assigned to Team Kakashi. And the first thing Kakashi would do would be to ask them about themselves and what was it that they wanted the most in life. For Menma, that was becoming Hokage, and for Sasuke, that was to become the head of the Konoha military police force. But for Naruto, his dreams matched the will of his mother. He wished to find and rescue his father. An admirable dream, Kakashi would call it. With Team 7 formed, they would set off on their missions. All the while, Kushina and Jiraiya met. Any news, Jiraiya-sensei? She'd ask over lunch. Jiraiya would smile. Actually, yes. I've been working on Orochimaru's case recently, and I learned that he joined up with a rogue shinobi group known as the Akatsuki. The details aren't exactly known yet, but there are rumors that there is a man among the group that possesses a swirling mask with a single eye hole. They also say he possesses a Sharingan. Kushina seemed ecstatic with this new information, but now comes the hard part, finding more information. Is Orochimaru still with this group? Jiraiya shook his head. He was with the group for a time, but he eventually left. I'm not sure why, but it's likely they were stifling his research, so he decided to leave. Kushina sighed. If only we could get our hands on Orochimaru, then we could ask him about it personally. Kushina said this, not yet aware that Naruto was listening in on their conversation. They would proceed to do the Land of Waves mission in which they would encounter the Demon Brothers on the road, but Naruto would single-handedly destroy them with his powers. Naruto, by this time, is essentially in full control over his version 1 cloak. He doesn't yet know how deeply his power can go, but he does at least have a grasp on this. Its strength shocks even Kakashi and Sasuke. Kakashi had heard the rumors from his mentor, but he never thought that this child would have so much power. 
Naruto would have a far harder time with Zabuza, but luckily for them, Menma was there. Menma would attempt to use Shuriken Jutsu to attack Zabuza, but Zabuza would merely block them with the Executioner's Blade. To Zabuza, this was merely a novice's attempt to attack him, but it was far more than that. Menma would create a Rasengan and suddenly use the Flying Raijin Jutsu to appear behind Zabuza and place the orb right into his back, sending Zabuza flying and freeing a surprise Kakashi. Zabuza would cough up blood, the strike having caused damage to his internal organs. Haku had no choice but to step in at this point as the battle was lost. Taking the supposedly dead Zabuza with him, Haku escapes. The team would stop by the home of Tezuna to rest after their long and eventful journey. As they ate dinner, they'd be surprised by the presence of a child who grew hateful towards the group, criticizing their dreams. Menma took it personally, but Sasuke would calm him down. Naruto was confused and would look to Tezuna and ask him about it. The old man would recount a tale. You'll have to forgive him. He's not been the same since his father was murdered. Naruto's ears would perk up. Murdered? Tezuna would nod. Kaiza was his name. He was the one who taught Inari what it was to love something and became his father figure for a time. He was the village hero. That was until Gato and his criminal organization came in and killed him as an example. Naruto was stunned, but he was also shocked to hear the child's name. Wait, the boy's name is Inari. Tezuna nodded. Naruto let off a small smile. That was my father's name for a time. He sat there for a moment. Naruto would get up from the table and turn. Kakashi would watch. Where are you going, Naruto? Naruto would look back. I'm going to speak with Inari. He would slowly make his way up the stairs and stop outside of Inari's room, where he could hear crying on the other side. He would knock twice. Hearing a sudden silence, he'd ask, Can I come in? Suddenly, the door opened in front of him and a small child was found standing there before him. Naruto looked down at him and smiled. The boy maintained the same cynical gaze. It perhaps grew stronger. What do you want? Naruto's smile faded a little and became somewhat sorrowful. I wanted to talk to you about some stuff. Is it okay if I come in? Inari shut the door in his face. Naruto just sat there stunned for a moment. He knocked again. Go away, a voice shouted from inside. Naruto spoke. I wanted to talk about your dad. He stood there for a moment. I, I know you don't want to, but I, I really want to talk to you about it because I lost my dad too and I just wanted to talk about it. Can I come in? The door would open and he'd see Inari once more, whose expression seemed to have softened. The boy sat down on his bed and held a pillow, hugging it like some precious pet. Naruto walked in and sat down on the bed too. For a moment, he remained silent, but as his gaze turned to the child, his expression softened and his lips began to move. You have a very nice name, Inari. The boy didn't bother looking up. My mom gave it to me. She named me after the fox god that brought increase to the land. She said that the rivers through here were carved out of the landscape by the kami of increase. Naruto smiled. Inari was my father's name too. Inari looked up. Naruto smiled and put an arm around him. I lost my father too. He was taken away from me the day I was born and nobody's seen him since. I worry that he's been hurt, killed. So I know what you're feeling. You feel that in a world like this, heroes can't exist. The boy looked down as a tear fell onto his pillow. My dad was my hero. He was everything I wanted to be. I didn't think there could be anyone as heroic and kind as he was, and then he was killed because of it. And nobody saved him. Heroes don't exist. There was one hero, but he died a long time ago. Naruto nodded. Not everyone is meant to be a hero. It takes a special kind of person to fight for another. To give up everything, including their own life, to make sure that someone else is happy. People like that are few and far between. Inari looked up. Are you a hero? Naruto shrugged. I don't know. I became a shinobi so I could find my dad, but I want to help you. I want to free your village from Gato. I want you to have justice. So don't give up on people yet. Anyone can be a hero if they decide to stand up and risk everything for what's right. Sometimes they lose. Sometimes they die. But it's because these things are possibilities that it makes choosing to do them heroic. He hugged Inari. I know what you're going through. It's okay to cry. It doesn't make you weak or any less of a hero. Inari looked up to see Naruto was losing his composure and was beginning to cry too. All it takes sometimes is one person to stand up to inspire others. Heroism, it's contagious. Inari hugged him tightly. The day after, they began to leave. They made their way to the bridge where they were caught by Haku and Zabuza. Naruto and Sasuke would end up captured by Haku's demonic mirroring ice crystals and were unable to do anything to escape. It was then that Menma would throw one of his kunai into the trap and would grab hold of Naruto and Sasuke and teleport out. Naruto would thank Menma for his help and would, alongside Sasuke, prepare to face Haku. Haku would just let his technique fade as it gave him no advantage here. Not so long as they had a practitioner of space-time ninjutsu on their side. So Haku began to use a new strategy. Just stand aside. I'm only here to stop the building of the bridge. I don't want to kill you. Naruto stood there for a moment. I don't want to kill you either, but this bridge needs to be built. Gato is hurting these people, and if this bridge offers the people freedom, it should be built. Haku listened. Admirable words. 
If only we could have shared the same side. Haku would clash with Naruto, but before the battle could really escalate, Haku turned to see that Zabuza was about to be killed, and dove in front of the blow, taking it himself. Zabuza too would be defeated, but that was not the end of their troubles. Gato and his men show up. Did you really think you could stop us from halting the building of this bridge? Naruto would stand there against Gato and his men to the surprise of everyone on his team. Kakashi would tell Naruto to pull back, but Naruto refused. He looked to Gato. You've hurt the people of this village enough. This bridge will be completed. We won't let you stop it, even if I have to be the only one protecting it. Naruto would then pull from behind him the inherited blade Kogetsune Maru, the blade given to him by his mother. His father's blade. This blade in the past had been used to stand up for the little guy, and now Naruto would use it again for the same. The men all laughed at the idea of a single child standing against them. Naruto would activate his version 1 cloak while gripping the blade tightly, a look of steely determination on his face. Gato laughed once more. What's a single person gonna do to stop my criminal empire? Suddenly, there was clamoring behind him. Naruto smiled. Who said I was alone? Inari would show up to the bridge with as many villagers as would come. Any able-bodied person was there to help. You don't own us anymore, Gato! Inari screamed out. We'll be free or die trying! Suddenly, the villagers rushed past them and went straight at Gato's men with a battle cry. Gato's men were startled and began to fall back, knowing that they'd die if they didn't. Naruto looked back at Inari with a smile and gave him a thumbs up. Inari would smile and do the same. Later on, as the mission came to a close, they prepared to leave. Tazuna would thank them for everything, and as they turned to leave, Inari would call out. Naruto would look back. Inari'd walk up and hug Naruto. Naruto would return the gesture. I guess the Land of Waves has a new hero now, he said, patting his head. Inari smiled. He looked up at Naruto and saw his ears, and everything just clicked. Your father. I'm named after him, aren't I? Naruto smiled and nodded. Your mother named you after my father. Inari would smile solemnly. I hope you find your father, Naruto. Naruto would hug the boy and bid farewell and begin to leave. They'd walk all night to make it home. To say that Kakashi was impressed with this team was the understatement of all understatements. Naruto's drive and determination truly was something to behold. Coming from a true fan of Jiraiya's works, Kakashi was one of the few to know the secret of the name, and he was pleased to see Naruto living up to it. He hoped one day soon he could play a role in finding Kurama and bringing him back. Upon returning home, Kakashi would make his way to the office of the Hokage where he'd inform him of the mission's success. When he was informed that the Chunin exams would soon take place, Kakashi was the first to volunteer his students. Upon finally making it home, Naruto was tired. He walked into the house where he was greeted by his mother. The first thing she would do is walk in and give him a hug. She'd then begin to check him for any wounds. While he didn't seem to show any serious injuries, she would ask him if he'd eaten anything yet. He'd shake his head, obviously tired from the trip. So she'd go into the kitchen and cook him up a grilled cheese and make some apple slices to go with it. And if you thought she forgot to add the peanut butter to them, well, you're crazy. Naruto would sit there at the table and eat the food so quickly that Kushina was a little worried he might get a stomach ache. She just watched him as he ate, sitting on the other side of the table, her head propped up with one hand as a smile ran away with her lips. Naruto would finish eating and sit back in his chair with a sigh. So, how was the trip? Kushina would ask him. He would smile. It was great. A lot tougher than advertised. Had to fight some mercenaries. Turns out old man Tazuna had a price on his head. Kushina was horrified. It got that dangerous? He smiled. But it all worked out in the end. I'm glad we went. We were able to free the Land of Waves from the control of a crime boss, and I also met a young boy named Inari. Kushina's brows raised as her smile once more returned. She leaned back. Oh, did you? Naruto nodded and explained the situation Inari had been in and how he related to him. Kushina smiled. Well, I'm glad it all worked out. She stood. So what do you want to do now? Naruto lay his face upon the table. Sleep. Kushina giggled. Well, go take a shower. I'll get your bed ready. Naruto would walk off to do as commanded. Kushina would begin to set up his bed for him. She thought back on how similar to Kurama he really was. He had drive and ferocity, but there was something in there that Kurama didn't seem to have. Where he got it from, she didn't know, but it was a genuine kindness, so deep that it seemed he would be willing to give you the shirt off his back if prompted. He genuinely cared for everyone, and he made friends wherever he went. If they were open to being friends with someone that looked as strange as him, then they'd become good friends. It seemed like that was something more than genetic, though. It was inscribed into his very soul. He would return and crawl into bed where his mother would pull the sheets up on him. She sat there as he fell asleep. She kissed his cheek, and for a moment, she had been transported back in time to when she and Kurama were younger. She wanted to protect this forever, but what she wanted most of all was to bring Kurama back so that Naruto could have his father again. She closed the blinds and kissed his cheek once more. Good night, Naruto. The sound of metal clanged as Naruto jumped back. Before him was Neji Hyuga. Their kunai crossed as they continued to attack each other. 
Neji's attempts to use the gentle fist technique had fallen flat as Naruto revealed himself to be full of enough power that he could merely pop back open his Tenketsu after they were closed by Neji. This did not put Neji at a disadvantage though. While Naruto was superior in most aspects, Neji's control and use of the Byakugan gave him a solid chance against Naruto. The crowd roared as the battle continued. These were the tuning exams, and due to the prodigious nature of Naruto and the rest of Team Kakashi, they were allowed to participate. That's where they were now, in the middle of the final exam. The concept of teamwork fell away as even team members would end up fighting here. It was everyone for themselves, and Naruto knew well that he would eventually have to fight Sasuke and Menma, but until such a time he wouldn't worry about it. Instead, he tried to keep his head there, in the moment. With every attack, he learned something new about Neji. The biggest thing he learned was that Neji's Byakugan had a blind spot at the back of his head, which meant that Naruto could come in from that direction to get a good hit in. And so he added it to his strategy, finding the best way to go about it. And with a final strike, the battle was over. Naruto was declared the winner. As he walked back to the stands though, he passed by Menma who was waiting his turn. But first came Sasuke. Where's Sasuke? Naruto asked. I don't know, Menma said. He must still be off training with Kakashi. Naruto's mouth fell open. He's still training? Menma shrugged. He's working on some new technique that mixes lightning release with the Rasengan. Naruto sat down. Well, he's going up against Gara, so we best hope he completed the technique. Gara entered the arena. He waited there for a time. Naruto saw him enter and thought to himself how strange he felt. Something was wrong. It felt like he knew Gara, despite having never formally met him before. Naruto sat there and watched. Sasuke, late as ever, shows up at the last possible second for his match. Naruto leans forward to watch. At the start, they're just sizing each other up before moving straight into Taijutsu and later Ninjutsu. Despite everything he tried, there was nothing he could do to break Gara's sand shield. It was then that Sasuke held his hand out. Naruto sensed the swirling of chakra as he did so. He sat forward. He's gonna use it. He's gonna use this new Rasengan variant. Suddenly, his hand is covered in lightning chakra. Naruto's head drops. It failed. No, look, Menma pointed out. Suddenly, Sasuke rushed forward at breakneck speeds, and with this technique, not only managed to shatter the sand shield, but also stab Gara with it. Gara let out a troubled yell as he saw the blood. And at that moment, the Hokage's box went up in smoke, and a genjutsu was placed upon them all. Naruto lay there unconscious for a while until he awakened. He rushed off after Gara to help Sasuke. Both he and Menma caught up, but Sasuke is no match. He calls for the others to stand back. Naruto sees the grotesque form Gara's taken and suddenly realizes what this is. You're like mom. Gara, in his partial transformation, stands there, foaming at the mouth. Naruto holds his hand out to the others. Stand back, I got this. Naruto suddenly enters his version 2 cloak. You see, Sasuke wasn't the only one to train for his matches. Naruto had been training with Jiraiya, who helped him understand how to make use of his father's techniques. Naruto would enter the battle with Gara as Menma would check on Sasuke to see if he was hurt. Naruto calls out to Gara and asks him why he's doing this. Gara states that it's because he was born to kill, but above all, he was hired to kill by a man with pale skin and the visage of a snake. By listening to that description, Naruto pegged that he probably meant Orochimaru. Naruto had been studying up on this ever since he heard Jiraiya and Kushina talking about it. His ears twitched as he stood there, his body coated in a thick layer of blood red chakra. Give up now and I won't hurt you. Gara scoffed and pushed his hand forward, the sand extending the reach of his strike. Naruto jumped up onto a tree and then down onto his arm and began running up it. Gara saw him coming and tinier arms appeared out of the sand making up his arm. Naruto sliced through them though. Gara used his sand to form a shield but Naruto broke through this too with the force of his own downward strike. Gara was stunned, confused at how Naruto could possibly break his defense like that. Naruto punched him into the air and Gara soared through the sky, not of his own volition. Suddenly Naruto appeared above him and struck him down, causing him to hit the ground hard. Gara lay there for a time. Naruto landed a ways away from him. Stay down! Gara rose to his knees. You think I'm scary? You have no idea. He suddenly used a jutsu to put himself to sleep. Once he was asleep, the beast within him arose. Shukaku, the one tail. Naruto stood there as Shukaku appeared before him. The tanuki looked down. For a moment, Shukaku mistook him for Kurama's Jinchuriki, but he found he was something far more interesting. No way. That old fox procreated? Naruto looked up. You know my father? Shukaku laughed. Know him? He's basically my brother. Sadly. Naruto stood there. Dad is missing. He got taken from us. Shukaku looked down on him. And this concerns me why? I'd be happy if he ended up dead, sealed, or anything else equally permanent. 
Naruto's battle stance softened. Please, Mr. Shukaku. My name's Shukaku. Please, Mr. Shukaku. Please, help me find my dad. He sat there, his ears angled down in sadness. Shukaku began to laugh. You expect me just to tell you? What's in it for me? Naruto looked at the ground as if he were looking for something to offer, but he was merely in his own head. He looked up and held up his sword. This is Kogutsune Maru. This is my father's sword, my only memento of him. It's not much, but it's all I have. I'll give it to you if you help me. Shukaku was silent for about 10 seconds. All right, I'll help you find him. If that is the Kogutsune Maru I know of, it's his most prized possession. Naruto returns the blade to its saya. Shukaku begins to shrink down. I'll join you. My Jinchuriki may be problematic, but trust me to make him follow your orders. Gara would then wake up and see Naruto. What happened? Why are you still alive? Suddenly, he would grab his head and go silent for a while. His face seemed to contort in terror. It was then that Kankuro and Tamari would appear there at his side to defend him. They would threaten Naruto, but Gara would stop them. No, we're going to help them. Tamari and Kankuro would look back in confusion. Gara's eyes commanded their respect, and they agreed to his orders, even without an explanation. That was just the kind of relationship they were stuck in. They knew that their brother was a monster, and they knew that their titles as brother and sister would only buy them so much leeway. Naruto was confused, but it made him smile as he knew that he gained a possible way to find his father. Sasuke and Menma would vehemently express their disapproval of this to him. Guys, I've never met my father. Not in a way that I can remember. I've been searching for him for a long time and have turned up nothing, but now I have a chance to find him. I can't pass this up. Please. After some deliberation, which consisted mostly of just Sasuke and Menma shooting each other questioning looks, they agreed. Gara sighed. If we do this, we do it quick. I can't stay in Konoha after this and I'm not going to wait for you forever. You return to Konoha and get only what you will need. If you're not back here by sundown, we're leaving without you. Naruto nodded and together he and the three made their way back to Konoha. As it turned out, Orochimaru, under the guise of the Kazakage, had attacked them and the third Hokage was dead. But Naruto and the others could not stay for the funeral. They needed to pack for a mission. Naruto walked into his home where Kushina found him. She pulled him into a long hug and kissed his head multiple times. Relief came to her in the form of tears. You're okay. Thank heavens. I thought you were hurt or worse. Naruto pulled away. I'm fine, mom. I gotta pack though. I leave tonight. He made his way to his room. She followed him. Leave? Why? As Naruto began to load up what he would need into his pack, he continued. I have found a chance to find dad and possibly even avenge old man Hiruzen. What do you mean? I met another tailed beast today. Shukaku, the one tail. He said that he would help me find dad. Kushina stepped forward and put her hand on the pack. No, 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 no. You're not going with Shukaku. Naruto looked up. What? Why? For the simple fact that Shukaku and your father hate each other. I'm not even talking like a general avoidance. I mean, they actively wish death upon each other and search for any way to hurt them. If you go with him, you won't come back. Naruto shook his head. This chance is too perfect, mom. I gotta go. She shook her head. I forbid it. I know you want to find your father, but listen. We have to find another way. We cannot trust other tailed beasts, particularly Shukaku. Your father had a strained relationship with his fellow tailed beasts. We'll wait for the intel division. They're hot on the trail of Orochimaru. Just wait. She took his bag and walked off with it. You're not going with Shukaku and that's final. Naruto stood there silently for a moment, his hand still acting as if it were holding an invisible bag. He walked to his bed and lifted the pillow to his face. He pressed his mouth into it and screamed as loud as he could. He fell into his bed. As nightfall came, Naruto, looking up at the ceiling, knew that he couldn't just pass this up. He grabbed whatever he thought he would need and could carry on his person. He then snuck out the window. All the while, Kushina stood in the kitchen. She felt a little bad about this. Naruto hadn't come out of his room all day. She thought it was important that he understand why he wasn't going to lose anything by waiting for the intel team. She went to his bedroom and knocked. Naruto, can we talk? She opened the door to find his room empty. The door open. Oh no. Naruto made his way to the meeting place where Sasuke and Menma were already waiting. Tamari and Konkuro were standing by Gara, who was sitting on a stone. You certainly made us wait, didn't you? I thought I told you to be here by sundown. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck in frustration. Sorry, my mom told me I couldn't come, but I'm coming anyway. Menma looked at him. Are you sure that's a good idea? Naruto thought about it. Yes, when I bring dad home, it'll all be worth it. Gara stood with a sigh. Let's do this then. He began to walk away with them. Naruto walked up next to him. So, uh, how does this work? You like, just sense where my dad is, or? Gara's dark eyes kept forward. I take you to where Orochimaru is. He'll tell you where to find the Akatsuki. Then, I'm out. Naruto shook his head. Nah, -uh, that wasn't the deal. The deal was that you help me find him and I give you the sword. 
If you don't help me find him, you don't get the sword. What do you think I'm doing, dumbass? I'm helping you find him. Naruto shook his head again. No, the deal was you help us find him, not help us find the guy who helps us find him. If you want the sword, you gotta stick with me until I find my father. Gara scoffed. I don't care about your sword. Suddenly, he gripped his head and leaned up against a tree, uttering a string of profanities below his breath. Fine, let's just go. Gara led them through the forest for a good ways, across the plains, and past the final valley. As they walked by, Naruto couldn't help but admire the statues. Sasuke stopped and looked at them too. He looked to Naruto. That's Hashirama Senju and his eternal rival, Madara Uchiha. They fought each other here and their battle caused this valley to exist. Naruto looked over in confusion. They fought each other? Over peace? How does that make sense? Well, you see, both of them believed in peace, and they both wanted what was best for everyone. But eventually, Madara's ideas changed, and he lost faith in his friend. In hopes he didn't screw over the Uchiha or cloud their eyes with a false solution, he tried on multiple occasions to destroy the hidden leaf. Naruto nodded. Oh, so he turned bad. Sasuke shook his head. People aren't always black and white like that. The shinobi world calls for sacrifice, and sometimes that can be of a moral nature as well as a physical, familial... Madara, like Hashirama, sought peace, and their methods collided, which caused this battle. Madara may have had methods people disagreed with, but his intentions were of a pure heart. He wanted people to be happy. Why else do you think they made a statue of him? You don't make statues of your enemies. Madara helped found the village, and then his ideas changed on what brought peace. He had good intentions. Then again, I suppose the road to hell is paved with those, isn't it? Sasuke began to walk away. All the while, Naruto thought deeply about it. He continued to walk with them until they eventually found Orochimaru's base. You're sure he can lead us to my father? Naruto asked. Gara looked in for a moment. Can he? Yes. Will he? That's harder to answer. Orochimaru is a little like the devil. He'll do things for you, but he'll always take his toll, and the toll is far more than it's worth. Understand that. For you, you'll have to give up something important to gain what you seek. Could be your morals, could be your friends, your body. Orochimaru will take his pound of flesh. Beware. Aren't you coming in with us? Menma asked. Gara looked at him. I'm still with you, but I'm not going in. I don't fear many things in this life, but Orochimaru is one of those few things. I've failed him once. I dare not approach him until a deal is struck. Naruto nodded. They walked inside. Sasuke looked to Naruto. You know we're gonna die, right? Naruto looked to Sasuke. Possibly. You have a plan, right? Menma asked. Naruto looked around at the structure. Working one up right now. They walked deeper until they were caught by the sound 4 plus 1. They're then taken to Orochimaru, who, despite the intense pain he's in, plays it cool and acts as if he was expecting them the whole time. After all, Orochimaru understands that it's not only important to have power, but to project it, even if it's not there. Often, the threat of something is enough to deter action and put the enemy into a state of terror, even if there is no real threat. And that puts all the cards into Orochimaru's hand. What have we here? He asks curiously. Naruto begins to speak. We're not here to bust you. We're actually here for your help. Orochimaru sits forward, his hands a dark gray color, the cost of his battle against Hiruzen. Oh, and what is this favor? We want you to tell us where the Akatsuki may be hiding my... Hiding the Nine Tails. Orochimaru smiles. This is interesting indeed, but I'm not a charity. I do barter and trade. So tell me, what will you do for me in return that I cannot already do for myself? Naruto thought for a moment, looking at Orochimaru's hands. Perhaps we can heal your arms. Would that be enough? Orochimaru scoffed his way into a chuckle. I can merely jump into a new body to repair my arms. I don't need to have them back. Naruto was not exactly sure what they could do for Orochimaru besides that. Orochimaru smiled. What I do need is a new body. Menma and Sasuke looked to each other. What are you asking us to do? He asked Orochimaru. I'm asking you to do nothing. You walked right in here and exposed yourself to my reach. I wish to take the body of that Uchiha there. He possesses unusual potential for an Uchiha. I'll take his body. Sasuke got into a defensive position. Naruto shook his head. Nope, out of the question. Orochimaru began to laugh. You understand the situation you're in, don't you? You don't have a choice. Naruto then held up a paper tag. This is a bomb. Orochimaru looked at it. Oh, planning to blow yourself up? He shook his head. No, I'm planning to blow you up, particularly this entire facility. All of your precious research, gone. Orochimaru sat back. You bluff. You would be unable to do that if you were caught by my sound four. Suddenly, a Naruto shadow clone ran into the room. We're all set up, boss. Naruto smiled to his mirrored image. Good job, me. He turned around and raised two fingers. All I have to do is will them to explode and this whole place comes down. Orochimaru seemed to sweat. You're still bluffing. It's not true. Even if it was, you'd die in the blast too. Naruto looked at the tag in his hand. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. 
you have no way of knowing. He then attached the tag to his forehead, but the question remains if you're willing to risk it. I'm willing to risk everything and sacrifice everything for my father. I'll die right now. I'd rather die than go home and tell my mother that I failed to bring her husband home. So look into my eyes and tell me I'm lying. I'll blow myself up just to blow you up. Now tell me where the people who took my father are, or I'll detonate every bomb I've planted, here and now. Orochimaru looked into his eyes and saw Naruto's conviction. He sighed. It seems the cards are now in your favor. Fine. I'll show you everything I have on the Akatsuki. He snapped his fingers. A map was brought to him. It's been a while since I saw their bases, so things may have changed. However, last I checked, they had bases all through this region. He circled a bunch of places in Kirigakure, but their main base, where they're likely holding the Ninetales, would be here. He pinpointed Amegakure. He pulled out a second map. There's a statue there of a demon with the Rinnegan. That statue marks the entrance to their base. Go there and you'll find what you seek. Naruto took the maps and removed the paper bomb from his forehead and dropped it on the ground. His fingers still raised, he took the maps. If you send anyone after us, I'll know, and I'll activate the tags. So be a good boy and wait here, Orochimaru. Naruto turned around and began to leave. As they left, they met back up with Tamari, Konkuro, and Gara. Menma looked to Naruto and asked him flatly, Did you really set any explosives? Naruto giggled. Of course not. Sometimes the amount of actual power you have isn't as important as the amount that you tell people you have. He lowered his fingers. Suddenly, the entire base went up in a fiery explosion. Everyone turned back to look. Menma looked to Naruto. I thought you said you didn't set any explosives. I didn't. That's because I did, Gara said. That man killed my father. Konkuro looked over. Well, to be fair, Rasa wasn't exactly the world's best dad. I never said he was, fool. Revenge on him was reserved for me. Because he stole my chance at revenge on my father, my revenge falls to him. I hope he rots in hell beside that bastard of an old man. They turned and began to walk away. It wasn't long after that Kushina appears there alongside a large party of other skilled shinobi, including Minato, Kakashi, and Itachi. In their search for the missing Team 7, they encounter Orochimaru's base. Kushina's eyes are wide. Did Naruto do this? It's possible that it was Gara or Shukaku, Kakashi says as he lowers to the ground and touches two fingers to the soil. No chakra signature. Either nobody's home or nobody survived. Kushina stood there in awe for a moment. Let's continue then and find the children. Kakashi let loose Pakun. He pet the dog and spoke. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. Now I need you to see if you can't pick up Naruto's scent. Naruto and the others were walking to Amegakure. It was closer and didn't require a boat to reach. Not to mention that Orochimaru had stated earlier that it was their main base. So what are we supposed to do? Menma asked. How do we get in? Naruto looked over inquisitively. Ame is walled off, Sasuke said. They're not allowing people in, especially not shinobi from other nations. Naruto thought about it for a second. Gara looked over. Whether it was him or Shukaku speaking, he didn't know, but Gara did speak. Oh, has the wily fox run out of tricks? Naruto shook his head. No, I think I have an idea. He took off his headband and ripped the sleeve on his jacket. He rolled his head on his neck. Let's do this. The guards stood by the gate, keeping watch as they always did. None were to pass. That was the command. They faced the bridge as the deluge of rain continued to pour down upon them. But as they watched, they noticed tiny silhouettes moving towards them. Six children, each one of them being dragged by another. They held their spears, ready for anything. Eventually, it all became clear. These children were caked in mud, looked half-starved, and one of them appeared to be beaten half to death. The six of them pulled forward to the gate. Please, can you help us? He asked. The guards crossed their spears. Nobody is allowed to pass into the city. Menma looked up at them. Please, our friend is dying. We haven't eaten in days, and the moment we got money to eat, we were robbed, and they hurt our friend real bad. I think he's dying. Naruto's feet went out from under him, and he hit the ground. Blood seemed to pool in the water below. Menma looked up, tears in his eyes. Please, I'm begging you, we'll do anything. Just don't let him die, he's the only family I have left. The guards looked at them and felt conflicted between doing their job as ordered and saving this dying child. Suddenly, their consciences caught up with them and they opened the gate. Fine, you may enter, but don't tell anyone. Menma crawled forward and began to kiss their feet. Thank you. The soldiers pulled back, creeped out by it. Don't overplay it, Sasuke whispered in his ear, as he was also on the ground, prostrating himself in gratitude. They lifted Naruto up and pulled him into the city. As soon as the gates closed behind them, Naruto stood back on his feet and dropped the transformation jutsu. He then emptied the Ichiraku ramen ketchup packets he had in his pocket before ripping off his other sleeve to even it out. Way to sell it, Menma. Your ability to cry on demand really came through for us. Menma blushed. It was nothing, really. The rain made it easy. Gara walked past them. Let's just find this statue and be done with it. 
They began to walk through the streets in the rain. Naruto began to shiver as his jacket had been ripped. Gara then proceeded to steal cloaks from a shop when they weren't looking before tossing them to Naruto and the others. I hate to admit this, but I'm going to be useless here. My thing is sand, and this rain is dampening my abilities. This is going to be on you to finish, Naruto. Naruto took the lead. You got it! And so they began to search for the place that Orochimaru had told them about. This took them the course of a few hours. More than a few hours. Ame was big, and the process of looking for a single statue with the Rinnegan was tedious. That was until Sasuke's Sharingan activated pointed up. It's on the side of a building. They looked up to see a statue, made of what looked like machine parts sitting on the side of a building, Rinnegan eyes present in them. Naruto quickly scaled the wall. He almost lost traction a couple times due to the slick surface, but he kept going. The others gave chase quickly, with Sasuke shouting for Naruto to slow down so they could catch up. They gave chase. They ran through and suddenly came to a stop in a large room where a man sat with orange hair and lavender ringed eyes. They rushed in after him and also came to a stop. Tamari gripped her temples and growled. You absolute A-tier dumbass! You got us caught! Naruto got down into a fighting position. We're only caught if we can't beat him! He formed a Rasengan and rushed the man, only to be sent flying back into the wall with almighty push. He slid off the walls with eyes rolling back into his head. Menma looked at the man and then at Naruto. Yeah, we're not going to be able to beat him. It was then that the other paths of pain approached them. What have we here? A deep voice stated. A man wearing a swirling mask approached them. It's the Nine Tails brat. Pain sat forward in his seat. We will add his chakra to the statue along with the others. More than that, another voice said as a dude that looked like a Venus flytrap had a baby with the checkerboard appeared. This other one possesses the one tail, he said looking to Gara. Payne then spoke. Lock the others up. Take the one tail to be unsealed and put the fox with his father. Zetsu grabbed Gara and took him to another room as the six paths locked away Team 7 and the Sand siblings. Toby would take Naruto to another room where they would find Kurama laying in a bed unconscious. Was it kindness? Who knows? but Toby allowed Naruto to go to his father without restraint. Naruto crawled up into the bed and looked at the man who appeared to be a much older version of himself. Dad? He looked up at Toby. What did you do to him? Nothing. We merely put him into a slumber so that he couldn't escape us. Get comfortable, because we're going to do the same to you. When you next awaken, you and your father will be one within the Ten Tails. He then cast Naruto under a Genjutsu, causing him to fall asleep. Just outside though, Pakun was sniffing. This is extremely difficult in the rain, the dog said. Give me a fresh whiff. Kushina knelt down and let the dog smell the ripped sleeve that they had found. Pakun turned around. I still have a scent. It's dying quickly, but I've got it. He led them in the direction. He stopped in front of a building with a statue of a face on it. He looked up. This is the location. Kushina gazed up at the building. Naruto must have a lead if he went here. Itachi looked up and began to carefully ascend. Kakashi was right behind him. The team entered the facility and continued. Pakun sniffed around. Yep, definitely smell him there. They followed the scent into a room where Pain awaited with his six paths. Kushina stood there. Where is Naruto? Pain sat there. He's with his father right now. Kushina's eyes widened. Kurama's here? Pain stood. Indeed. It's a shame that you'll not get to see him again before you die. These six paths of Pain launched into battle. Itachi suddenly activated his Monk Yakyo Sharingan and called upon his Susano. He used it to defend her as she managed to enter her version 1 chakra cloak with what was left of Kodama's energy inside of her. Something she'd been saving for a special occasion and that occasion was now. We need to finish this quickly or I'm going to use up the last of Kodama's energy. And without that, I'll die. Itachi nodded as his Susano expanded and brought its weapons to bear. At that time, Toby appeared and also went to attack, his Kamui giving him a distinct advantage. But this was a worst case scenario for him as Kakashi was also here and possessed the only thing that could defeat the technique. The exact same technique. Kakashi attempted to face off against this man, but it was obvious that he had no chance. As he continued to try, he would activate his Mangekyo, and through his use of Kamui, he would discover a way to tank Toby's ability to use Kamui as well. Through it, he opened a way for Itachi to utilize his Susanoo's Blade of Tatsuka and seal him away. Pain doubled down on his attacks, and it became obvious that there was no way for Itachi to stand against him forever. Kushina was being ragdolled, and even if Kakashi managed to surprise one of the six paths and send them to the Kamui dimension, they managed to return later with their own space-time ninjutsu that the Rinnegan granted them access to. Pain stood there, having pushed the slowly exhausted group into a corner. Kushina fell out of her transformation. That's it guys, I'm tapped. The six paths drew closer. That was, until suddenly one of them was flat out obliterated by a tailed beast ball. They all looked back, and coming out of a room, Naruto helping him move was Kurama. With Tobi having been sealed up, the Genjutsu had come to an end. Kushina smiled weakly and Kurama stood there activating his chakra mode. Pain took a step back. Kurama came closer, his nine tails swinging behind him. You know, I would ask about your eyes. 
They remind me of the Sage of Six Paths. That man was like a father to me. I loved him. I would have died for him. And perhaps I would have died for you too had you proved yourself to be his reincarnation. But now, I'm just gonna kill you. Whether you're the Sage of Six Paths or not, you screwed up big time. You mess with my family, and you threaten my wife and my child. And for that, I'm going to destroy each one of you and the real body you got hiding in some back room somewhere. The other six paths rushed Kurama, but he stepped forward with his full power and bodied each one of them with little to no effort. I mean, do you expect anything less from him? He still scales above Naruto, and at this point, he's about as strong as Naruto in the climax of the fourth Shinobi World War, so he one-shots. He then makes his way to the containment area and breaks the rest of Team 7 and the Sand siblings out before he goes to the next room. As Zetsu attempts to pull the one tail out of Gara to steal it away, he's caught by the throat. Kurama looks him dead in the eyes. Zetsu holds up his hands. We can talk this out. Kurama simply says, go to hell, and evaporates him with a tailed beast ball. Naruto helps Gara up. Kurama looks to Naruto. Get your mother out of here. I'm destroying the entire village. Naruto looks back. No, dad, you can't. Kurama looks back. Why not? Naruto stood there. Because they're not evil. I got in by playing on their sympathy. They thought I was dying and broke rules to let me in so they could save my life. Please, don't punish the good with the bad. Kurama looked to his son. Fine. Only this building. Regardless, get out. Naruto and Gara met up with the others, where Menma managed to use his flying Raijinjutsu to get them out of the city. They looked back and suddenly saw a flash as a massive fox rose from the skyline. Naruto was in awe. My father is... that? People said he was a god, and I guess I see now. They weren't far from the mark. Kushina looked to him. Your father is an ancient force of nature, but he has a heart like gold. She passes out. Naruto turns back. Mom! After a while, Kodama forces his way out of the village, and none dared stop him. He meets them right outside the gates. There, he sees Kushina on the ground. He runs to her. Kushina! He comes to her side. She opens an eye. Kurama. He takes her hand. W what's happening? Kakashi looked to him. She used the last of the power you stored within her in a bid to save you. Kurama looked down. She smiled. We both knew that one day we'd have to say goodbye. You're immortal, and I'm just a human. I age, and you don't. Whether it's natural or unnatural, I would still leave you a widower. Naruto took her hand. Mom! Kurama looked deeply into her eyes. Maybe. Maybe one day you will, but today doesn't have to be that day. Her head bobs forward as she catches it. We might not have a choice, Kurama. If this is the end, just know that I will always love you. And Naruto, you're my precious child. You possess something me and your father could never amount to. She wiped the tears from his face. You possess a heart full of limitless love. Don't let this ruin it. Kurama shook his head. Stop talking like that. You're not gonna die. I won't allow it. She looked back to Kurama. I love you. Her head then fell back. Kurama quickly put his hand on her chest and began to send in pulses of his chakra. No, come back, damn it. Come back. He kept sending pulses, but got no response. Come back, he shouted as tears rolled down his cheeks. Come back, come back. A week later, Naruto sat at his house on the couch. Beside him was his father reading the paper. Naruto hugged up against him. Kurama laid the paper down. So, tell me what it was like for you growing up. I missed so much. Naruto smiled softly. It was strange. I was the only kid in class with a fox's tail and ears. I never understood why. Mom then said it was time that I knew and told me about the nature deity named Inari, the one she loved, and the one who gave birth to me. I remember seeing her talk about you, seeing the joy in her eyes, but also sorrow. I'm sorry I wasn't here for you, Naruto. If I had been able to, I would have come back. Naruto nodded. It's okay. I know why you had to leave, and Mom knew too. And I know that wherever she is right now, she's glad that you're home. Kurama nodded. By the way, where is your mother? He asked. I'm right here, she said as she came out of the kitchen holding a cup of coffee. She handed it to Kurama. He turned to face her once more. He leaned forward and kissed her. Naruto's right. I am happy. I'm so happy. This is all I could have asked for. Kurama shook his head. No. This is all I could have ever asked for. I lost everything and gave up on life, but you reminded me that it was still worth living. I'll always be grateful to you for that. For the days you visited me in my cage just to talk to me, I'll treasure that always. And I understand that one day I will lose you again, but I won't forget your love. And if you reincarnate again, I swear I'll find you. She smiled and kissed him once more. I'm gonna hold you to that. And that wraps up the story in a nice little bow, don't you think? I really enjoyed writing this one. The reimagining of Kurama and Kushina's relationship was a fresh take on the way that they saw each other. Kushina had always seen Kurama as this giant ball of hatred, but if she could have seen past that, then perhaps Naruto wouldn't have lost his parents that day. There's no telling what could have changed. 
Of course, this doesn't have to be the end of the story. If you enjoyed it and would like to see a sequel, let us know by clicking that like button and telling us in the comments that you would like to see a spin-off to this that goes a little deeper. Until next time, peace. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.